This episode of the Esoteric Order of Roleplayers is brought to you by the generosity of our backers on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash esotericrp to find out how you can become a backer too. Remember to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to keep up with all the latest news, and join our Discord community to chat with players and fellow listeners. The Esoteric Order broadcasts from Santa Fe, New Mexico. We recognize these episodes are produced on the traditional territory of the Tewa-speaking Pueblo peoples, and we acknowledge their community, their ancestors, their elders, both past and present, and future generations. The Esoteric Order of Roleplayers present The Great Game, a Castle Falkenstein campaign, with David Larkins as the host. Programming note for this session. Unfortunately, Jade's microphone was giving her a lot of technical issues throughout the session. It's worst at the beginning and does get better as the session goes on. And you'll be happy to know that by session one, she had all the issues worked out. So, um, yeah, since I think everyone here knows at least one other person, but we don't all know each other. So, um, I think we'll start out, I kind of, you know, did a little round of introductions in the email for the, you know, pitching the game idea, but we can, we can kind of go, go around and just do a quick refresher. Um, Desiree has suggested... Uh, we all uh, get in with our name, our location, and some piece of media that we've recently encountered that we liked. So it could be a book, movie, TV show, music, comic book, whatever. So I'll start. And so I'm David. Hello. And I'm in Santa Fe. And um, the piece of media I liked was uh, something I watched to research for this uh, very campaign, which is the 1937 Prisoner of Zenda, which if you haven't seen, I uh, highly recommend. Um, Starring Ronald Coleman. Yes, a very relatable actor for everybody. But also Douglas Douglas Fairbanks Jr., who is uh, sizzling hot in that movie, I have to say. Like, whew, (laughs) you know? (laughs) If, if If I swung in that direction, man. Sex on toast. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> anyway, uh, let's see. Jade, let's do you next. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Jade. I am in Albuquerque. I've been in San Diego, so I'm going to explain. Uh, I screwed Beast in Beast Rider and Beast Rider. 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 Beast Hmm, nice. Also, your volume's a little low, if you could. Uh, as you look into that, we will continue as I go counterclockwise on my Zoom window, so Santiago would be next. Hi, I'm Santiago. I live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And most recently, I've been enjoying the tits off of the Sandman production on Audible. Um, starring like literally everyone (laughs) and it's really well done it's this super like old school um, radio production teleplay type of 
thing and it's amazing and I want to say it's James McAvoy voicing the main character and I think also the narrator and it jumps all over the place and it was recently like in World War One, and then like Victorian England and so it was really coincidentally adjacent to what we're doing uh, right now so let's propose cool. nice all right Kenny you are up next that's me <laughs> That's you? <laughs> I got you uh, with your mouth full. You did. <laughs> On mute. <laughs> That's right. Um, hey, everybody. My name's Kenny. I am also in Albuquerque. Um, and what is it here? Media that I watched that I liked. I just watched the, caught the first episode of Lovecraft Country, mm. uh, which was very good. I was uh, very excited about it. It's, um, I'm seeing a lot of articles titled, uh, like, you know, Lovecraft was a racist, and here's how uh, Lovecraft Country confronts that, and it mm -hmm. really does a, a, a amazing job. I'm, I'm hooked on, on episode one, so hmm. look at, looking forward to the next. Cool. Yeah, I, I haven't seen any, any bad words about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Rainy, you're up next. It's -a me. <laughs> um, I'm Rainy. I also live in Colorado Springs on the other side of the living room from Santiago. And um, he introduced me to Umbrella Academy, which has been an interesting watch. I was vaguely familiar with the like comic stuff, so it's been cool to see. Hello, I just froze, so I didn't hear any of that. <laughs> Well, it was really good. He just missed the whole thing. Damn it! Yeah, it was it was literally riveting. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> so many rivets. I'm all out now. Oh, well, that's very uh, steampunk. So it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and Alex. Okay. Well, um, my name is Alex. I live in Irvine, California. Just recently moved here. Actually, like this week from Los Angeles. Um. Media. Well, I'm gonna go RPG because that's media. Sweet. I, yeah. And sure. I've been rediscovering my love for Palladium. <laughs> I've been <laughs> completely just all in on Palladium for the past um, couple months, and uh, yeah, I was actually just before we got on here, I was working on a little Palladium thing that I'm running, uh, kind of a little side thing for Dave. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's uh, it's fun. It's like you know going back to my teenage years and with a new whole new uh, outlook so whole new attitude whole new attitude yeah that's awesome <laughs> yeah that's fantastic it was like heroes unlimited and like riffs and all that kind of stuff or yeah cross, cross publishing on that one. yeah the multiverse yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and i've also inadvertently because i've been buying some products from palladium.com i'm now on kevin simbieta's mailing list which is endlessly entertaining because he's like super self promoter and uh, it's just it's just amazing. I get these little treat emails every now and then that are just you know these giant blocks of text of him like talking about whatever, <laughs> whacking yeah. about life or about yeah. you know how much you need this new product. It's like yeah, it's like he treats the mailing list like his own personal blog slash uh, promotional outlet. So it's pretty. I, res I respect the hell out of that. <laughs> That's really great. It's just yeah. a huge block of text too. It's like, oh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> well, and it is it is cool because like he uh, Alex got me to order something for them too, and like he actually like signs the title page of the of the game and does a little doodle, you know, and says like, "Let your imagination soar" and stuff like that. So. A little dragon doodle in there. It's like yeah, oh, yeah. Amazing. And then he and then he personally packs all the all the orders too. It's very sweet. <laughs> That's so cute. I know. Yeah, he deserves his own platform via mailing list. He does, <laughs> I say. Don't we all? <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> Jay, didn't you get a copy of Transdimensional TM, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles at the used bookstore in Los, uh, Las Cruces? I did. Can you nice. Now? Ah, it's still very low. Really quick. Technology. Yeah, well, you know, it's inevitable. Yeah, she's a fickle mistress. <laughs> Quite so. Weren't you having an issue like that once, Alex, where it was like you just couldn't 
couldn't get the volume up on your mic, and then it was yeah. turned out to be some setting on your computer or something. Yeah, I think it was that I had to actually go into like the microphone settings and do something weird with it, or it was like it was using some weird driver or something. I don't know. I just kept yeah, pushing yeah. buttons until it worked. Uh huh. Yeah, that's the way. <laughs> the audio issues are the bane of my existence, man. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I downloaded this to your episode and like it was, you're a little quiet and I'm like I will choke you out. <laughs> I spent 18 hours fixing that. Fuck you. I did. Uh, I just recently downloaded like a voice, kind of a voice changer, but more just so I could EQ my own voice. You know. Uh, mm, mm, mm. But man, it was like oh you gotta download uh, this and this and this and I'm like okay and then I did it and I hated it. And when I uninstalled it, I had to like reconfigure all of my audio drivers, and oh. it was literally a nightmare. Ugh. It was a waking nightmare. <laughs> <sighs> all right, while we're waiting on that, I'm gonna try to get a light so I'm less spooky. Okay. I mean, I Turn off the light so you're more spooky. <laughs> That's right. Just be a pair of glowing red eyes. <laughs> Just get like an under Found underlit. It. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I could do that if I didn't care about my phone battery, I guess. I just yeah. have the spooky under light the whole time. Just like, <laughs> Hello. Uh -oh. <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, too spooky, too spooky. Ah. <laughs> this I, isn't a horror game. How do I close this? <laughs> it wasn't. And if we were recording video, you could like overlay the Stranger Things theme for that part. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. Speaking of which, I'm kind of looking at if I can put in some background music just to, you know, carry us along. There are no there are no playlists on Spotify called Castle Falkenstein, and I'm very disappointed. That's impossible. How rude. <laughs> I know. You know. Seriously. All right, I got you. I'll make one right now. There you go. Oh, there I was going to say, my, my niche sense is going off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, Jade's back. Hello. Here she is. Can you hear me better now? Slightly? Okay, let me see. I just pulled out the microphone. For some reason, it seems like maybe my microphone jack is jacked. That would make sense. So, yes. headphones are working well, but my input is not working well. Okay. Right now I'm just using my laptop microphone and I'll see if I can get something better for next time. Perfect. Okay, well, let us jump into it. We'll we'll just sort of muddle our way through uh, and uh, see what we can do here. So, um, let's see here. One thing that would be good to know is that I know some of you no Castle Falkenstein. Jade, you've actually played Castle Falkenstein before. Um, Kenny, did you say that you bought the rule book? Yes, I bought the rule book. Um, however, reading it, I was like, what is this? <laughs> the fuck is this? <laughs> what is, where, where are the rules? <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's that kind of game. So... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to love it already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's very loose. Um, in fact, like, I think it was my first introduction to the concept of LARPing because the rules are so simple that they're basically like, you could just totally LARP this or quasi LARP it, you know, without even changing the rules, basically. So um, I never LARPed it myself, but it was just like, yeah, they're spending all these pages talking about it. I'm like, what the hell? So, um, yeah, no, the rules are very, uh, I would say qualitative. Uh, they're very like narrativist. Right. So, um, it's really just about kind of like coming up. I mean, you've all got these character ideas, which is great. And so, and that's why I kind of wanted to get that discussion going through email ahead of time, just so everyone would have a chance to think about it and wouldn't be too on the spot because really it is just kind of like envision your character and then write it down you know it's like uh role-playing games for the gifted program kind of thing um but um but yeah so we'll get into that and just to sort of reiterate uh what i'm planning is um 
the the sort of the home base of the uh, campaign will be Paris. Um, but we're actually going to start in Vienna. Uh, and uh, the, the basic setup, which we'll get into uh, next week when we start the game proper, is that uh, all of you have booked passage to Paris along uh, a or on on board a new type of uh, steam train uh, that is powered by a Babbage engine. So it's like a it's like an artificially intelligent steam train. Uh, so there's no way any of that could go wrong. Um, and I'm sure it'll be a smooth ride. Is this right. is this just horror on the Orient Express? <laughs> ah, you got me! Damn it! I was hoping I was hoping you would notice. I wish. <laughs> I think I still need a healing period from that. Yes, you do. I, I think we're all <laughs> Jade and I are both still recovering from when we played it. Um, so, um, but yeah, so that's the basic setup. Uh, it's this new kind of state of the art uh, train. So. Uh, the great thing about that is that your characters do not necessarily need to know each other. If you want that to be an aspect of your character, like that you know one of the other characters, totally fine, totally cool. If you all know each other, also fine. But don't feel like, you know, it's like, oh, how do I fit into this group? The group is going to be forged in the crucible of this uneventful and peaceful trained voyage. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> you'll just all end up like with the same meal ticket and you'll just be, okay. you know, sitting at the same table. So. <laughs> You know how that goes. Oh, I do. <laughs> it's very awkward. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I might, I might cast a vote that we all know each other already. Okay. I, I would cast that question. vote. I don't, I don't care if I'm voted n- no, but you just want your voice to be heard. I just want my voice to be heard. I'm, I just want to vote. Okay. <laughs> you know, like that as well. I feel like putting in that legwork just ends up making it make more sense as opposed to these like five, six random strangers meeting and then like we're all of a sudden best friends. Like, right. like a bunch of like third graders or something like or, that. Yeah, or, 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 yeah, or worse, like we're, we're, uh, we're for some reason at odds and forced to work with one another. Like, uh, uh, the, yeah, that would not be good. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, I want to, yeah. yeah, I want to yeah. gel like immediately. You know. Cool. But we'll see. Whatever. I, again, I can shut up at any time. Well, and like the I, core, the core can be gelled, and then one or two of you want to be, you know, the the uh, you know shadowy ranger in the corner smoking their pipe. You know, that's right. Me, yeah. me, me. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> I'll turn the lights back off. It'll be fine. <laughs> we can all sit in our uh, in our separate corners, <laughs> but we all know. <laughs> brooding at each other you know what's right. up <laughs> right yeah yeah and me just like anyone want to do anything no no all right no. Just... <laughs> cool cool yeah what are you doing still brooding D- yeah. <laughs> yeah david i have a question how glowy are my eyes beneath my hood <laughs> <laughs> yeah. ah and castle falkenstein they're as glowy as you want them to be Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> i need to make a glowy eye check you're right. Oh, I failed. <laughs> I, failed. <laughs> I, I was blinking. <laughs> <laughs> you suck. All right. So um, now, so that takes us then into my next question, which is sort of more of a logistical question. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's no character sheet in Roll20 for Castle Falkenstein, uh, which makes sense. But the default character sheet in here actually works pretty well because there's kind of like a bio and info section and then the um, basic character sheet, the attributes and abilities tab just has literally a column for attributes and literally a column for abilities, which is very um, pretty much everything you need. And then you could use the bio and info section for your journal. Now the game kind of encourages the players and the, and the, what do they call them? I don't call them the game master, do they? I forget. Anyway, um, the person running the game to uh, kind of keep their own journal as well. And like you can even keep it like kind of in character, uh, you know, as the campaign goes on and becomes this record of, you know, the campaign from your POV. And I think they even say like, you know, by the end of the campaign, you'll have a little novel, you know. Um, So if you're feeling that 
epistolary and ambitious, um, we could certainly set something up outside of Roll20, like uh, an Obsidian Portal wiki or some other wiki of that nature. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of pull, you know, the group and see what you guys thought. Uh, I'll definitely be keeping probably a separate journal just on Google Docs. And mm-hmm. then after that, I can uh, disseminate that information however uh, de- is deemed appropriate. Kindle mm-hmm. store. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> As a forever GM, I'm always a fan of more random stuff to track. So... I'm always good with extra stuff, but I know it's not everyone's favorite. Same. I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I do I do like a good Obsidian Portal, you know, so I'm not against it by any means. I'm, I'm way into good Obsidian times. Portal. Yeah. 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 Alright, I'll set one up. Sick. Yeah. I made an entire Obsidian Portal for a Conan Exiles server one time. <laughs> It was wow. outrageous. It was outrageous. I think I still have it. I'll shoot you a link. It's got like nice. R- it's got like RPG rules. Oh wow. It's like yeah. today I still had no pants. <laughs> and then I tried to put on pants and yeah. they broke. They, and so I have broke. no pants. <laughs> I died sure. clutching my stone hatchet. <laughs> yeah. On a stone hatchet. Nice. Have you ever I was had picking up rocks on the beach. Dust storm? <laughs> yeah. Totally. Oh, and the then a story. crocodile ate yeah. my face. Such a good game. <laughs> You're bringing back so many horrible, horrible memories. <laughs> All those things happened to me. <laughs> you were eaten by a crocodile during a dust storm. <laughs> <laughs> With your nuts hanging in the breeze. <laughs> yeah. M- Mudman uh, comes out of nowhere and <laughs> imps, I believe they call them. We didn't know what they were. We were like, Mudman. <laughs> nice. Wow. Okay. Good. So, uh, yeah, it'll be it'll be an appreciated effort, which is the main thing. And uh, cool. So I think that I think that's the logistics of it. Um, any questions before we dive in? Nope. Okay. All right. Don't know enough to have questions yet. <laughs> Yeah, right, huh? Oh, okay. I guess that was that would be another uh thing. So, you know, I, I did I did send out a little bit of information about the setting or links to information about the setting, but uh I guess just to kind of do the elevator pitch once again, uh, you know, this is an alternate reality um earth where uh it's it's kind of a kitchen sink kind of setting cuz you've got magic, you've got steam technology, You've got um, kind of a League of Extraordinary Gentlemen thing going on where like fictional characters from Victorian literature are actually real in the setting. The fun twist there is that the authors who wrote wrote about those fictional characters in our world uh, also exist in the world of Castle Falkenstein, but they're more like biographers or reporters rather than fiction authors, you know? Uh, so like Jules Verne is like the Minister of Science. For France and like uh, you know all the stuff he writes about are like actual research projects rather than just like you know things he's pulling out of his ass. So uh, you know, uh, yeah. So anyway, it's kind of like that. Um, and yeah, um, I think that's kind of the elevator pitch. Really, it's it's sort of you know like uh, magic and technology in a Victorian setting. I guess would be the the log line. You know. Um, so, uh, but I felt like you guys were all getting, getting into the, the feel of it pretty well in the, uh, emails. So, um, and you all have a basic idea of what you want to do, which is great. So I'll just give you a quick overview of how character creation works, and then we'll just kind of go through it. And like I said, it's just kind of just writing things down. Uh, I have a bunch of prompt questions I can ask you. They'll kind of get you thinking and filling in details. And then there'll be some additional details that you can, um, you know, ask me about, like specifically for your character and, and so forth. So, um, so yeah, so your, your character sheet is your diary or journal, uh, whatever you want to call it. And so there, this is how you just kind of, uh, quantify to a certain extent your character and then keep track of their story. And as they say here, it's uh, it's where you will start the story of your persona so far, what he or she is like, 
what he has been doing and where he's going next. Second, it can be used by both players and hosts to write down any offstage activities that may occur between entertainments. Ah, uh, yeah, that's another another aspect is you can kind of, you know, do the um, downtime uh, stuff by using your diary. And then lastly, a diary is used to write down your character's goals and what he or she has accomplished towards those goals, an experience log of sorts. So, um, we just start off basically with uh, the primary question, which I personally never like to answer this question first. And if you don't as well, that's fine. But the question is, what is your name? I knew that was coming. <laughs> I felt this cold chill go up my spine. Right. I, I literally just pulled up a tab that was like char random character name generator. Oh, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> Frantically searching. Like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it even says here, many people like to skip this step until after they've answered all the other questions first. For them, the name is the capstone of inventing their persona and can't be done until they really know it well. So... I don't know. Maybe, maybe, I mean, everybody else, I feel like everybody else kind of has more of an idea of who they want to play uh, rat, uh, uh, and I do not. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of like, I, I love the idea of being like the um, kind of like Egyptologist-ish. Uh, I'm like, I'm like, okay, I have two goals for this character. One, they have to wear a fez. And two, I want him to say, see you in hell at some point. <laughs> so, so you're going to write that as a goal in your character that's diary? Goal. That's my whole arc. <laughs> I wish one day to say, see you in hell. I will exposit that in character if need. <laughs> right. That's good. That's a legitimate yeah, I mean, goal. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I can't have... be mad at that. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. I, just, I have no idea, like, I uh, I love, like, uh, I think I read somewhere about, like, what are, what Americans are like in this. Mm. Uh, America's kind of a weird, like, there's, like, indigenous shamans that, like, totally changed the course of history for America. Yes. Uh, but I don't know if Americans are still, like, like, am I Brendan Fraser from The Mummy or am I, like, Bill the Butcher? <laughs> Like, uh, yeah, it could be either one. Um, yeah, the uh, the version of America in the world of Castle Falkenstein basically stops at the Mississippi River. Um, there is a bear flag republic in California that's its own thing, ruled by Emperor Norton I, of course. Um, and um, I think there's a Republic of Texas, but I don't know off the top of my head. But otherwise, the you know, even though this game is from the 90s, there is no Confederate States, which, you know, hey, cool. Uh, the, the Union won the war. Nice. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of, you know, like, they they don't shy away from, like, sort of depicting this. Because it's, you know, it's the Gilded Age, right? So it's like the robber barons and, you know, these these cabals of uh, hyper-capitalists who are kind of, like, running the country from behind the scenes. And um, I don't know, Kenny, if you noticed, since I know it's germane to your interests, but uh, one of the sorceress lodges is the masons right the masonic lodge yeah. uh in europe and in europe they're like kind of the the og you know masons and they're you know the good guys but in america they're like the american masons so they're like actually part of the problem totally <laughs> Which, yeah totally. you know so yeah. um yeah there, there was a whole quick history fact there was a whole political organization that was just straight up called the anti-masons yeah the anti-masonic party right yeah yeah yeah, and I'm yeah, like, yeah. i'm like we won <laughs> <laughs> right so um so anyway yeah there's there's a whole uh very interesting supplement on america for this game interesting that, uh, yeah it's uh it's a different flavor of game and it's definitely much more like wild wild west you know the show and or movie um so it's um kind of that feel of like a lot of like as a lot of like kind of government shenanigans and who can you trust and you know sort of this paranoia but also like secret agents and you know stuff stuff of that nature uh, but then there's also like you know you could be a, a bayou pirate uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico, or you know, you could play Native Americans, or you know, there's a lot of different options. So, it, but it's just a totally different flavor of okay. the game. So I wanted to stick with the you know the core rules. But if you're an American in you know the old world, that's totally fine. 
Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I would love to hear what everybody else is thinking. If mm-hmm. if uh, if you know, but you know, just yeah, so totally. I can kind of figure out where I fit in and all this. The next question is, where do you come from? So that's you know, it's fine. We're kind of bleeding over into that. Uh, does anyone actually have a name picked out? I guess would be the main I question. Do. Okay, what do you got, Rainy? Um, my character's name is Astrid Faraday. Nice. Um, and I thought that she was just going to be um, from Sweden because that's fun and relevant to me. But now there's this bear flag republic, and now I might have to do that. <laughs> and Jade, you raised your hand? Uh, yes, I chose uh, Brexter Poland. Nice. Excellent. And where are you from? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. I am uh, one of the, the fair folk, uh, the other people, um, from High Breezeale, mm-hmm. which is across the Vale. Excellent. All right. Anyone else with a name yet, or just an idea of where you're from? I got both. Cool. Go for it. Um, Leaning Turkish, um, mm-hmm. because being referred to as the Turk seems really cool. And, <laughs> um, but uh, to that end, I, I'm, I've got a first name so far, and I'm trying to zero in on a, uh, a surname. But Iskander is uh, the mm. first name that I've got yeah. so far. Yeah. Nice. What about you, Alex? There we go. Let's mute it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, no name, which uh, isn't really a surprise. It's usually the last thing I put on my character sheet. Just, yep. It's always been that way for some reason. But mm-hmm. I do, uh, my character hails from Austria. Um, haven't decided exactly where, but Vieta works uh, pretty well since he is going to be a diplomat, which kind of sets things up nicely for this whole Paris trip, given the reason why he would be yeah. traveling from Vienna to Paris. So Yeah, very much so. Very much so. Oh yeah, I guess that would be another thing. So we, we're not re- really quite into your occupation, occupational backgrounds yet, but um, definitely be keeping an eye out as we go through that for everyone. You know, if you do want to have connections between characters, like you know, hmm, how do you know each other? Because really, all it takes is just one connection to one other character. I mean, you could, I guess, create a little chain <laughs> of connections if all else fails. So, okay, so cool. Uh, so we've got Sweden or possibly California. I like the range. Probably Turkey. Um, Austrian. Ferry. And Kenny, you're thinking American? I'm thinking American. Yeah. Um, I, I might, I think, uh, I think I might go for some like Indiana Jones inspired kind of character. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Some, someone who's, I don't know really handsome <laughs> nice um, you know Tom Selleck was almost cast as Indiana Jones I'm just saying no Sean Connery was almost Gandalf and we avoided that <laughs> we avoided that fate <laughs> <laughs> maybe wow. this isn't the worst timeline <laughs> uh, right. a lot of, you will not pass yeah you shall not pass yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, dude. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> All right. Well. Uh, okay. So that that actually you're, you're setting up these questions, man. So that leads us right into the next one, which is what do you look like? Physiognomy and physique. So uh, and there's there's like these whole like lists of sub prompt questions. What's your sex, height, age, other particulars like hair and eye color? Um. There are some uh, dictats, like for example, if you're a dwarf, uh, you can. Uh, there are only male dwarves or no female dwarves. Uh, it, you know, fairies tend to just in general have like one type of gender, you know, expression. I guess you could say, um, which I think Jade is uh, very much for your character. And um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, I think it's it's fairly wide open. And of course, I'm already sort of picturing these characters coming together out of the ether spelled in the Victorian way um, but uh, I don't know Alex why don't you why don't you give me an idea of what you're thinking of in terms of appearance so I'm thinking um, 
my character will be in his mid twenties, male mid twenties. I haven't decided yet exactly what, but I feel like he's going to have some kind of um, maybe a, a, a laudanum uh, habit or mm. something along those lines. Cool. Uh, he's he's a he's a he's a diplomat, but he's kind of low level diplomat, so he's kind of like in that sort of you know that range. Uh, mm -hmm. He's well dressed, but there's always something slightly off about his appearance. Something mm. slightly disheveled. Looks like you know something that's just just a little bit off about him. Mm. Uh, and yeah, very uh, tall, thin, kind of a bit hollow, yep. cheekbones, yep. just kind of like this sort of uh, uh, not quite haunted figure, but you know, definitely it looks like he's you know a bit worn around the edges. I'm getting Klaus Kinski. Would that be far off the far off the mark? That could work. That could work. All right. Klaus Kinski is a Victorian diplomat. I want to see that movie. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, I looked him up too. I'm like, yeah. Oh, <laughs> uh huh. Uh yeah. So cool. Um, let's see. Cool and Jade, why don't you give us an idea of your character's appearance? Oh, yes, so I am a Nixie. I am one of the uh, type of fairies known as the Lake Ladies. I am one of the smallest, which I'm about four feet tall. I have smooth gold skin and uh, just a wild mass of, of dark hair and very dark, almost kind of too dark eyes. Ooh, nice. Excellent. How big are how big are you? How tall are you? Like four feet tall. Like oh, three okay. to four feet. Okay. So fairly small. That's cool. Almost pixie like. I didn't know mm. if you could like fit in my pocket or something, you know. <laughs> uh, so it's a Nixie, not a Pixie. Oh. These are in fact like I think they're four to six inches tall. They are. Yeah, pixies are. Pocket, pocket, oh, yeah. pocket pixie. Pocket pixie. Pocket <laughs> pixie. <laughs> From I'm going to mute myself. Okay. <laughs> I'll be quiet now. Um, all right. Cool. So let's see. Rainy. All right. I think I'm going to go with Sweden as officially um, because I like the idea of my character not really fitting the idea of Swedish. So mm. she's kind of short. Um, and she has dark hair mm -hmm. with a splash of freckles across her face and uh, wearing really like fine but sturdy clothes like she's expecting to get into something. Yep. Um, but yeah. Like uh, tweed and jodhpurs kind of thing. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> nice. All right, excellent. And Santiago, how about you? Skander Ozan is, uh, like mm. said, from Turkey. Um, he's pretty easy to describe because he's not exactly inconspicuous. You would describe him as hulking in appearance with uh, a humpback. Um, and he Ooh. has um, beautiful olive clear olive skin and a large Stalin-esque moustache that he <laughs> keeps pristinely waxed and ever so slightly curled not the overdone affair that you see typically today but just a very just little points maybe um and he's a quite dapper fellow he's fond of tailored suits because it's really the only way for him to get clothes that fit him because this dude is absolutely just huge he's like seven feet tall basically with shoes on and stuff like that and it, impossible to guess at the weight because he's just he, he you know uh, almost looks like a gorilla the way he lumbers around especially he's always carrying a, an attache case um, that he ne never seems to be without mm. nice I don't know if that's overdone at this point <laughs> <laughs> oh attache cases those are so last year <laughs> really fond of hats like if we're walking down a street and there's a haberdashery like where'd he go <laughs> how'd you lose him <laughs> He's seven feet tall and 500 pounds. 
He's back in the habit, Dasher. Sorry. Um, okay, so... <laughs> Let's see, uh, Kenny, did I get you? I don't think I got you for appearance. I'm for literally it. still floating around the nebula. <laughs> <laughs> cool. All right. I'm also setting up uh, little character sheets for everybody. So if you check your journal, you may already have one. And please feel free to start jotting stuff down, I guess, in the bio section. Probably be the best place. Uh, let's see, who did I get? Boom, 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 Jade. I need Jade. Okay. Uh, but let's see. Did we get everybody? Did I miss anybody? It's a little harder on the Zoom. No, I think I got everyone. Okay. Please speak up if I ever skip over you because I'm sort of. I need chameleon eyes here where I can like independently rotate my eyeballs and look at two different things at once. Um, okay. So the next question is What was your youth and childhood like? Describe your childhood and general upbringing. Did you have brothers and sisters? And if so, how many? What sexes? Were you legitimate or born on the wrong side of the blanket? A classic Victorian melodramatic plot device. What did your parents do for a living? How did you get along? And how do you deal with each other now that you're an adult? Were you wealthy, poor, or bourgeois? Did you go to school? And if so, what, kind, what kinds? Public, private, military, college? Were there any important family events or traumatic events that shaped the way you are now? Obviously, you do not have to answer all of those. Those are just to get your get your wheels turning. Uh, let's see. How about Alex? I'll pick on you. What are you thinking in terms of your childhood? Okay, so childhood. I want to say uh, he grew up in a uh, household that was kind of, uh, you know, would be considered maybe upper middle class, mm -hmm. uh, possibly with ties to politics or, you know, uh, diplomats, like his, his parents were kind of in that world and, and ran in those circles. I want to say he lived somewhere, um, maybe not, maybe outside of Vienna, not really, maybe like Innsbruck or something, like a little kind of uh, smaller town. Uh, and because he grew up in that environment, he always wanted to get into it himself you know it's kind of like it was just kind of the family you know not business but kind of legacy uh, I feel like he probably went to you know private boarding schools and all that kind of had that sort of upbringing he was very um, you know as far as his well-dressed well put together aspect you know that was something that he just kind of gained through osmosis being in that environment he kind of had this sort of path laid out before him where he would just, you know, he would get into being an ambassador, di diplomat, uh, kind of in those worlds. His first job was as an attache uh, with the Sealy court. And it was shortly after that very brief assignment that he developed his laudanum habit and started to come undone at the seams. And so all of this background that he has of this very proper upbringing, very impeccably dressed, very put together person, this one very brief uh, experience of his, one of his first assignments kind of undercut all of that. And now where he's out now is kind of this slow unraveling as he's kind of just trying to pick up the pieces from what he experienced there. It was not like anything, it wasn't the unseelie court. So it wasn't, you know, horrible, <laughs> it wasn't hellish, but it was very much a an experience that he had no uh, kind of basis for it. I feel like like as a person he's probably very, likes things just so likes everything very organized likes things very uh you know put together and this just completely unraveled all of that and so now he's kind of like left in the state where he's still operating on some of those ideas but he's also questioning all of them at the same time cool okay excellent yeah i'm just picturing him uh every morning trying to you know, uh, go into the whatever embassy or wherever he was like, you know, liaising with his Sealy berries and like, you know, keeps getting his shoelaces tied together when he's least suspecting it, you know, <laughs> it's just driving him yeah. insane. Yeah, yeah, little things like that. I think it was just all sorts of like little, you know, because I, I noticed in the, uh, that review that you sent us of mm -hmm. Castle Falkenstein, it was saying that the Sealy court was very much like they were content with just kind of fucking with humans, you know, yeah. just kind of, whereas this unseelie court were like, all right, we got to get rid of like these humans got to go. 
Yeah, uh, they'll they'll straight up hunt you for sport. Kind yeah, of so but yeah. the Sealies weren't necessarily <laughs> like super friendly. They were. It was more just right. kind of like their their idea of practical jokes. So I think for someone like my character who who didn't you know wasn't didn't have any real mechan- defense mechanism for that. He mm-hmm. uh, it just kind of yeah he didn't break him but came close. Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, so speaking of the Sealy Court, Jade, I don't know like you know. Uh, I mean, what's a childhood like for a fairy? I mean, what do you think? Well, as everyone knows, uh, fairies are just uh, physical manifestations of pure chaotic energy. Mm-hmm. Uh, taking on corporeal form as it uses us. So it was chaotic. It was a lot of just, um, yeah, being pure unbridled energy, I imagine, until probably a few hundred years ago. Uh, I was inspired to take form for the first time. Um, being one of the lake ladies and from uh, High Breeze Vale, uh, the gateway from our side of the Vale to uh, Earth is right over the ruins of Atlantis. And mm. I, in my wanderings, discovered these ruins and was really fascinated by all of these uh, creations of humanity. Um, Fairies uh, are incapable of imagination and of creation. And so we really uh, covet those things that we don't have naturally. I, I really just loved all of this, this architecture and this hulking ruin and wondering, um, how on earth did you come up with that? <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> I'm just picturing like fairies coming over to the mortal realm and like checking out all the penny dreadfuls and stuff like oh my god these are great <laughs> we don't have anything like that at home well so see this is the thing my theory is that um, humans dream I can't dream but what you imagine is real and so there has to be an earth where all of the things that you're dreaming are real and literal and I am dedicated to finding that plane of reality. It has Damn. To be there. If you imagined it, it has to exist, right? Because all these other things you imagined and they exist too. So, yeah, you know, it's just how it has to be. That's right. That tracks. Yeah. That's adding a deep metaphysical spin to this, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. What is the year we're playing in game? Ah, yeah, good question. So um, it's kind of 1870, you know, like you know, 1870, say. 75. I, I think, let's see here, I'm trying, trying to remember specifically. I, I know it's in the book somewhere, but um, I know that in the U.S. supplement, President Grant is still in the White House. So uh, for all you presidential nerds out there. Uh, yeah, so the the uh, the intro adventure is set in 1871. Okay, sick. So I don't, I don't see any reason to deviate from that. Okay, mm-hmm. great. I've got a character. <laughs> <laughs> wow! <laughs> All you needed was the year. And, uh, that's uh... really it. That's where I like to start. I mean, cool. Like, <laughs> as most questions, the first question I ask myself every day is, what year is it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now more than ever. <laughs> now more than ever. <laughs> All right. Well, why, uh, since you got something there, why don't we jump in? What was your character's childhood like? Can well, I'd like to uh, go back to the first question, which is what I look like. Oh, of course. Please. Um, I am, uh, I would say, a grizzled uh, elderly man. Mm. Um, American by birth. Um, I've got uh, kind of like... What imagine like Sam Elliott, I guess, kind of like slicked back, like long Sam Elliott hair, um, white um, chops, mutton chops. Um, I've got a, a an eye patch that I I had an eye injury in the war, um, and I'm basically like a cowboy. Like I'm, I I just walked off the I just walked off the set of Deadwood, and um, I have. I've, I struck it rich in the hills somewhere. I got a lot of gold, and I figured I'd get the hell out of America and uh, make it to the make it to the mainland back back to uh, 
to England or Vienna, I guess, is where I am currently. So yeah, that's what I look like. Maybe you're, uh, you know, like on a doing a grand tour or something since you got some money. That's right. You know? I yeah. got a, I got some money and I'm spending yeah. it all before I die. <laughs> You got that much. You have to work hard to spend That's, your money. <laughs> I got a little bit. I got a little bit. Just a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, as far as childhood goes, it was probably pretty rough and tumble. Um, I'll have to read what happened in America in Castle Falkenstein uh, to get a clear idea of like what kind of activity he was all involved in. Um, but probably, you know, just grew up a nobody. I, I really enjoy kind of playing the blue collar uh, hero, I guess. Um, somebody who uh, came from nothing and found themselves in extraordinary circumstances. And uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of my, that's kind of my bag. I'm just, I'm just here and I'm, I'm rolling with it, baby. You know? Cool. Yeah. I, I just pulled up a map of the uh, North America and Castle Falkenstein world. So we've got the United States of America, which, as I said, kind of terminates at the Mississippi River. There's the Free State of Orleans, which is basically Louisiana. And then there's the Republic of Texas, which, boo, encompasses New Mexico and Arizona. Oh, weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they, they claimed it in our world. So, you know, there you go. Uh, so, yeah, if you're kind of like a frontiersman, you could definitely be uh, Californian or Texan, I would say, would be the two most likely ones. Probably. Ooh, probably Californian then. Yeah. Yeah, the bear. Is, uh, did I call it the Bear Flag Republic? It's actually the Bear Flag Empire, apparently. Sick. Uh, <laughs> and that runs uh, ba that encompasses California, but also like most of Nevada, Oregon, Washington. You know, runs up to the Canadian border, and um, and then yeah, and then of course there's the Twenty Nation Confederation, which is the sort of Plains Indian uh, nation. So. That's cool. That's really mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Um, and then the ambiguous unorganized territory <laughs> that's between California, Texas, and the 20 nation confederacy or confederation. So. Interesting. Yeah. Could you send me that map? Absolutely. It's very tiny, uh, but oh. I'll send it to you. That's and okay. I have text. super robot eyes. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. All right. Uh, Santiago, how was your childhood? Tell me about your mother. Ah, yes. <laughs> the classic question. Um, it was a happy childhood in a small village with a large family, lots of siblings, and they lived in the uh, central villa around which the village clustered. So his father was uh, kind of a big deal in the village, but he doesn't remember um, what he did or whatever. Um, but he does remember his, a lot of the things that his father told him and taught him growing up. And primary among those was that uh, he, he's always been told that he was uh, destined for great and important things. And that's why he was named Iskander uh, when he was born. And everything was great until that day. That the peaceful village was attacked by a mysterious force of horrible leaping shrieking creatures. And the whole village was slaughtered except for Iskander, who was the sole survivor, who... Um, he fled into the wilderness and was found by uh, an imam from a nearby village. And he was taken back to the, uh, the mosque where the imam was kind of a, a head honcho and uh, kind of took him in and raised him as, as his own and completed his upbringing and primary education. But this imam was secretly an inventor and Iskander became his assistant. So um that's how he grew up and he's recently uh left um for vienna actually to pursue uh his education at the uh famous university there the name of which i totally know off the top of my head because i'm very cool and highly smart and stuff yes the university of vienna <laughs> right i knew it would be something like that but <laughs> i didn't want to fake the funk <laughs> Cal State Vienna. Cal State Vienna. That's exactly it. Oh, yeah. There is a University of Vienna. Of course. <laughs> of course there the is. The California University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> Whatever. I don't know. <laughs> right. All right. Cool. 
And that leaves Rainy. Wow. Um, let's see. I figured out how to have California in my background. So maybe we can have crossover there. But um, my mother is a proud bear flagian. Um, and yeah, I have two brothers. My father is a pretty well-known like Swedish engineer. And so that allowed me and my brothers to get into a, a good engineering school. Um, they have specialized in air travel whatever that looks like in this world. <laughs> I assume there's airships or something fancy like that. Uh, definitely. Yeah. Airships and then some, yeah, there's, there's okay. a lot. Yeah. Um, but because of the tales that I heard from my mother growing up of like shamanistic magic and tall tales, which aren't really tall tales because they're real tales. I was inspired to specialize in the crossover of magic steam and steel um, so that's my specialty that I went into in school which I assume I'm pretty fresh out of like looking to get into working in the field oh yeah I mean that's that's emerging technology so it would be like going to uh, going to university in the 50s to study you know uh, nuclear engineering basically so it's definitely cutting edge stuff. Sweet. All right, excellent. And so yeah, you probably would have studied that in uh, in Bayern, you know, Bavaria, because um, that's kind of the center of that um, of that uh, emerging technology. We'll just say. Rad. Mm -hmm. All right, great. Uh, let's see what is next. I lost my place. Okay. Uh, what are your virtues and your vices? What are your best qualities? Uh, what are your worst qualities or, or bad habits? Uh, so we'll go back to Alex. Okay. Uh, worst habit is um, his, his laudanum addiction that he picked up after his, uh, his um, stint as a uh, uh, attaché for a member of the Sealy Court. It is something that has, you know, it's just kind of this um, monkey on his back that's that he just has to deal with. Um, his best, his best, uh, you said like personality trait or, or uh, just feature, I guess you could say, is that correct? Uh, yeah, it's um, the best qualities about yourself. Examples, honesty, courage, friendliness. Okay, so best quality, uh, I would say he is, uh, he doesn't give up. If he uh, is, takes a task, if he promises something, he always keeps that promise. Uh, and he does the best that he can to achieve that. And um, he, takes it, he takes that very personally. Uh, and so, you know, you're never, you're going to get um, honesty from him and helpfulness. And uh, if he says that he's going to do something, he will go through with it, regardless of what it means to his own well being. So, honorable. Uh, yeah, maybe that's the shorter way of saying it. <laughs> All that's... that's yeah, no. Yeah, that's, yeah, definitely. Cool. Uh, how about Jade? Virtues and vices. I mean, really, that's all a bit relative, isn't it? Um, I would say, personally, I think that my best quality is my sense of humor. Everyone absolutely loves my sense of humor and my uh, jokes that I play on everyone. Everyone loves it. Super fun. No one has a bad time ever with that. Um, personally, I think that my best quality though is my curiosity. I like to think that it brings me just a little bit closer to having um, a bit of an imagination. I'd like to think that I can conjure unique thoughts all on my own and that's probably completely false, but don't tell me that. Um, also, my kind are known for their pragmatism. So I'm certainly a fun fairy, but we're also known for being very no-nonsense kind of fairies. And I think that really, by comparison, the rest of them are a bit silly. So 
you know, you won't find that here. Um, as for my worst qualities, I mean, I suppose you could also say my sense of humor uh, is probably not my most lovable quality. Um, also, I have a tendency to be a bit literal with how I interpret things that I'm told, and that can be a problem. I'm just, I'm terrified at the thought of a fairy being like, well, I guess my sense of humor might be my worst quality. Because it's kind of like, I mean, there's a few cases of broken limbs here and there with my practical jokes, you know. Yeah, that, that's... Is it, are they crying from laughter? <laughs> Most definitely. Or definitely, yeah. Could it be, that's definitely it. Are they screaming in appreciation? Yeah, it could, li there's literally no other explanation. Good times had by all. No other explanations. My so. character is already in the fetal position because of his <laughs> <laughs> first hand experience with this uh, sense of humor. Uh huh. <laughs> well, at least at least this one's more pragmatic, though. Maybe that's a little bit of a uh, a point of you know mutual understanding. <laughs> Not quite as flighty. <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, so Kenny, virtues and vices. I would say my, <laughs> I would say my, uh, my best qualities are, and I think these honestly just come straight out of the book, but it's, it's what I imagine uh, for this guy too, is that he's pretty courageous, uh, pretty brave. Um, and also because he has so much, uh, well, he's got a bunch of money now um, and he grew up poor, he's very generous with his wealth. Um, so, like, if people need money, he's like, yeah, here, take it, you know? Right. Yeah, totally. Those are my best qualities. Uh, my worst qualities are that I drink too much, and I'm an old dog reluctant to learn new tricks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I'm, like, a traditionalist, but I'm, I, I'm, like, like, Steam, just get some coal, damn it. I'm like <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that a horse and some and a, a good stiff breeze couldn't take care of. Right, yeah. You on a you on a train, you need tracks. On a horse you can go anywhere. Any which way. <laughs> Magic Don't just rub some dirt on it. <laughs> That's right. Damn. Huh. Just get <laughs> just get some mud on you. <laughs> Walk it off. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I always carry a bottle of super glue for any kind of right. <laughs> injury of any sort. That's right. I had to melt glue down back. my last horse <laughs> to heal that stab I mean, wound. <laughs> that actually works. That's right. It does. It does. For the record. No, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, yeah. You can legit my, do that. My pappy Just don't use a cotton magic. bandage. <laughs> that's oh, right. God. Oh, God. <laughs> that's right. Oh, man. Okay, cool. Uh, so, Santiago. Ah, uh, yes. Um, I'd say that uh, Eskander's virtues are uh, honest, protective, and relentless. And I think that going along with those those last two are um, not necessarily not not necessarily courage, but more of a reckless abandon and you know, just kind of forget that he can be hurt or whatever because his drive to uh protect those who are being uh oppressed or um, bullied or similar is a uh, overriding impulse and if he has a goal um he's just relentless in pursuit of that maybe tenacious would be better not sure yeah that sounds good and how about vices My biggest weakness is that I'm too brave. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to work too hard. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, he has a weakness for fashion and material trappings. He's not supposed to really care about that kind of stuff, but he's just really addicted to tailored suits, hats, pocket watches, especially. Um, he just can't seem to not acquire these things or to stop uh, buying them and they'll be distracting and so on and so forth. And he constantly struggles also as a, as a young man, uh, he struggles with 
constant temptation um, because he grew up, you know, in a mosque. Um, so now he's constantly tempted with uh, drink and the uh, company of lovely women who are all too eager to, uh, you know, part him from his money that could be otherwise spent on pocket watches and hats and suits and stuff. Me, me and you might get along too well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, he knows he's not supposed to, but he is ready to party. But <laughs> and, the, and then you bring Alex's character along because you think it'll be a, a laugh to see this uptight diplomat, you know, sipping his, uh, you know, his wine or whatever. And he just goes completely nuts and uh, gets hammered. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm starting to see uh, yeah, a certain, uh, uh, what's, what's the term for it? A uh, codependency thing going on here. <laughs> oh, yeah. That, that's what brings you all together. Codependency. <laughs> Excellent. All right, that leaves Rainy. Uh, so I'm endlessly optimistic. Everything has a solution. You just have to keep working on it, keep trying. Everyone can be better. You just have to give them the chance. Uh, just, I think everything can be great. You just have to work on it. Um, that's kind of my advice to you. I'm more of a fixer and a doer than a listener. So you know, if people try to tell me their problem, I'm immediately going to try to fix it, even if that's not what they want. Um, I can also be pretty naive. Nice. Okay, so that then brings us into, once again, the question was anticipated. What's your style? Describe the kind of clothing or dress you prefer, as well as any special quirks that affect you affect as part of that style. Many times your mode of dress will be affected by the kind of personality you're playing. For example, you won't often find a mad scientist in a worth ball gown, but take a look through the notebook, meaning the rule book, and you'll see all kinds of examples of what people wear in New Europa, gowns, skirts, shirtwaists, uniform suits, all kinds of things. Obviously we all know Victorian style, uh, so I think we've all got a pretty good idea of that, but uh, yeah. Uh, let's see, Alex. How you picture your guy? So uh, he's well dressed at all times. Um, it's just from almost a, a habit, just kind of a, a you know the same way almost that his uh, his accent or uh, you know the way that he speaks is just something that he picked up as a young child and growing up. He has uh, that sort of uh, his his general the way he dresses, the way he carries himself is part of that too, uh, but it is, it's just slightly off. It's been um, affected by his mental state after his experiences. And it's nothing overt. It's not, you know, he doesn't have, you know, like it's not super disheveled or it's not something that's really obvious, but there's little details you'll notice that just seem a bit off. Mismatched socks, uh, you know, something in his handkerchief pocket that isn't a handkerchief. Uh, tie maybe just slightly off center or, you know, things like that that kind of just lend them this, this slight air. Someone who, who is very impeccably dressed will notice it and notice that there's something wrong about it. It's not an affectation though. It's not something that he does kind of to uh, present himself in that way. It's, it's literally his brain's a little broken and he just kind of forgets things or acts in a certain way uh, that is his, his kind of uh, outward expression of trying to fit together this puzzle that he had perfectly laid out that has now been shattered. And so he's just trying to like build the edge around it. You know, he's trying to build some, build this, rebuild this puzzle and it's kind of coming together weird. It's coming together a little different than it was originally. So that's kind of his physical appearance, I would say. Excellent. And uh, Jade, I'm very curious about this. How do, uh, how do uh, Nixie's dress in the mortal realm? Well, the great thing is I can pretty much uh, conjure up whatever I want it to be. Um, I just had to have seen it before. So I think I typically favor very like loose flowing gowns, probably in like blue and green silk. Um, and I have just a terrible uh, love for, for tiny little seed pearls. I probably wear kind of an ostentatious amount of them, just in like long, mm -hmm. long ropes of it uh, around my neck. Uh, otherwise, very little ornamentation. I think that I, again, have gold skin, so I sort of have a natural glow. Um, but I don't really need anything else. I have that, like, allure 
that's already built into it. So I think that especially due to my pragmatism, I'm not really interested in trying too much harder than that. I just sort of let my fairy charms work for me otherwise. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, Kenny. Well, I'm glad you asked, David. <laughs> I uh oh, oh I actually have the tab open here. I'm building a Pinterest board for which, oh, which I nice. I like to do with characters. Makes sense. Yeah, I'm a visual learner. Um, so my character style, like I said earlier, very kind of Sam Elliott, um, like white hair that I probably try to like dye red every now and again, uh, to kind of seem a little more youthful, you know. Uh, kind of maybe stay with the with the times uh mm -hmm. i've got i've got like two modes um i've got like casual mode where i look like like an american you know uh like duster coat uh cowboy boots uh, probably denim jeans for the era um and some kind of like maybe a maybe a shirt that i got somewhere like victorian you know like i got somewhere in europe um but the rest of my like just to be like oh that's a that's a nice shirt and i better look like one of the locals so i i got a shirt and just put it on with my duster and cowboy hat and you know all that kind of stuff uh, so i got like that's my casual mode um and then when i uh, dress fancy and i've got to go to like lodge because i think i am i think this guy is a mason um although he probably joined uh he probably he probably joined lodge like when he moved to wherever he lives now in Europe. Um, not Vienna, which is where we are now, but Paris, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when I go to Lodge, uh, I wear kind of like a simple, a simple suit, a uh, three piece suit with like a, a time piece. Um, but I have like a, uh, I've got like a heavy jacket that I just wear like over my shoulders. Um, and as like a memento for home, it's got some like bison skin around the collar. Um, and I carry a, I carry a cane that probably has like, um, like a, uh, an epoxied piece of coal as like the cane topper, you know? Nice. Now, um, you can, I, I'm pretty sure you could just be a, a member of the Masons, but do you want to take that up to actually being like a wizard in the Masons? Do you want to be like a, a wizardly type? I'm probably, I'm probably pretty new. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I would but be, like, I'd be a know. master Mason. I don't know what that means in game terms. Are all mm -hmm. Masons wizards? That's that. Well, see, that's the question I'm, I'm faced with here. Um, let me, let me zip up. To feel, the appropriate section. Yeah, I feel like even if I even if I was technically a wizard, I'd be like, "Y'all don't need me casting spells right now. Just <laughs> <laughs> just get up and do it." Damn. <laughs> <laughs> well, magic's pr magic's pretty cool in this setting because it is. It's definitely not like tactical. You know, you have to kind of weave. You literally have to weave it out of like magical energies that are circulating around, and okay. so you kind of build your spells. You know, like there's there's this list. And it's like, okay, I want to affect this many people at this range for this long, and I want it to do such and such and such and such. And you can just, you know, customize it, custom build it, and then cool. that gives you your target difficulty, basically. So the more stuff you add in, the harder it is to do, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, like a good soup. That's right. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, it, it's, real quick, is, is, yeah. anybody, is anybody else, uh, show of hands, is anybody else like, ooh, I want to cast magic? Yeah, I'm not sure how magic would integrate with the techno stuff. I'm a technomancer, whatever that would be. You're a techno I might, wizard. I might yeah. be. I'm. I'm. I'm totally fine with being the party wizard. Um, cool. If if nobody else is is uh, chomping at the bit for it. Well, I love the image of Sam Elliott with a buffalo skin lined uh, jacket as a wizard. Like that's pretty <laughs> I mean, awesome. I mean, me too. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. The eye patch. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> a sexy, sexy eye patch. That's right. That's, That's right. Yeah. yeah, the eye patch. The Jarlaxle style. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, yeah, cool. We'll we'll kind of discover that as we go along. Um, if, yeah, if, I get, yeah I'll, I'll be a wizard, uh, regardless of what level 
of Masonic influence I need to be. Nice. Yeah, uh, I think it's kind of kind of left open. It looks okay. like I'm just kind of scanning. So so basically, the way there's different like uh, magic traditions, different lodges and and groups and orders, and uh, and what differentiates them is that they all have their own secret tomes that they don't share with anybody else, right? And then that dictates the type of magic that they're best at because they're the only ones who got, you know, uh, Paracelsus's, you know, okay. Librum of this or that or whatever. <laughs> so it looks like for Masons, they are, uh, they are handy with alchemy and they're handy with illusory magic. Mm. Mm-hmm. I like that. I'm fine with being kind of like old fashioned, you know, that's probably what drove... That's probably what drove me to, I mean, that's what drove me to be a Mason was like being old fashioned and, and the history of it. So I'm sure. Yeah. I'm yeah. sure Sam is into that too. I don't know his name, but yeah, Sam. Sam. it's Sam for now. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then, yeah, Rainy, you're, you're uh, what they call a calculation engineer. Nice. So that's, uh, yeah. So that's uh, like you say, it's kind of a, a technomancer. <laughs> And then Jade will have, uh, for her character, will have some magical abilities, but they're just kind of innate to being a fairy. So, uh, okay. So then we have got Santiago for your appearance. You've already kind of covered that, but if there's anything else you want to throw into the mix, yeah. Um, so if it's very quiet and you listen very closely, actually, you don't have to listen too closely. You can hear each individual thread and button on Iskander's suits just kind of like <laughs> holding on for dear life um, because he's just straining to cover his bulk when he like checks his, his pocket watch and bends his arm it's just like stretches out <laughs> trying to contain it um, so he these mendings are part of his budget um but uh yeah tailored three-piece suits bowler hats uh vis- visible pocket watch chains um but how often do you look at a man's uh shoes really to uh call back the uh green um uh, shashank redemption not green mile uh, anyway um <laughs> so his shoes are not high fashion shoes they're uh or engineer boots but he keeps them to uh, polished to a mirror sheen to try to match uh, the overall ensemble. The ensemble. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. And uh, Rainy, you've also kind of touched on this, but if there's anything else you want to add? Yeah. Uh, so beside her like well-made traveling clothes, I would say they look pretty normal at a glance but if you did inspect them you'd notice like reinforced areas like the knees and elbows and all the hems and stuff are pretty sturdy um and she has like a nice like brocade and leather bag like her mary poppins bag but it happens to have like her heavy work apron some tools um and it should have her goggles except she's usually actually have she has them on her head a lot because she forgets to take them off goggles <laughs> yep <laughs> it's not steampunk without them <laughs> nope you gotta have the goggles you can't do technomancy <laughs> no without goggles. i would ask you to leave the game if you didn't <laughs> <laughs> all right uh excellent so uh that is that part and we are now on to the next part which is as follows. And the next part, as I get to the page, shall be, uh, okay, are you dashing or demure? Describe your personality in two words. For example, arrogant and headstrong, or friendly and outgoing. This is to give you a thumbnail view of how you relate to the world, a sort of mental summing up. I feel like we've kind of started to answer this question, but again, always add more. So Alex, what do you think? What is, are you dashing or demure? Are those my only two choices? Those are your only two choices. No. <laughs> Describe your personality in two words. Uh, okay. I'm going to say, uh, well, this is a bit of a juxtaposition, I guess. Friendly and aloof. Alternating that depending on his mood. So you might catch him in an aloof kind of weird moment, or you might hmm. catch him when he's a little more outgoing. Interesting. 
right. Uh, Jade, describe yourself in two words. Mm. I'm going to say curious. And can I can I think about that to like really like nail down? Of course. Second word. Okay. Absolutely. Kenny, two words. Like asking my wife for advice on this. <laughs> I'm like, what would you call somebody? Can I put a friend? <laughs> yeah. Okay. I would say, honestly, it's gonna be. This might seem weird, um, but we're not here to be normal. Um, I would say the first word would be romantic, um, and in the sense that uh, this this guy he like romanticizes a lot, and I think that's kind of why he ended up in Paris. Was he's like, well, I got all this money, I might as well go somewhere fancy, and you know, he's. Uh, he gets on over to Paris because uh, that's what he feels is like uh, what, where like rich, um, almost, uh, what's the word I'm looking at? It's like sophisticated people go, you know, like he, he I think he pines for that, um, grow, having grown up poor with humble beginnings. Um, so the first word would be romantic. Uh, the second word I'm going to have to get back to you on. Sure thing. I, I, I think that is will also have some kind of juxtaposition. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Santiago, two words. Boisterous and direct. Nice. So unlike I don't know, as a big dude myself and friends with other big dudes when you're big your whole life, you tend to be, I don't know, somewhat more quiet and reserved because you always, you know, are kind of shushed i guess so you kind of, kind of becomes ingrained and stuff like that and it didn't take in Iskander's case uh at all he, he's more of a reinhardt from overwatch if uh that scans with the crowd at all just you know huge and very out there and you know don't worry my friends and that sort of thing um and the direct ties into honesty you know where it's like you know, what's that on your face like you know just straight up uh charge right at something but it's also um social you know kind of like in uh another deadwood reference of you know have you ever thought of not charging directly at a thing and it just doesn't even cross his like planning process at all nice that was two words right yes <laughs> <laughs> two words then some I, uh, All right. I have my my second word. Yes, go. Pragmatic. Ooh, I like it. Romantic. That's one of my favorites. It's a good one. It's a good one. <laughs> Romantic and pragmatic. I've, so I've got this view of like an idealized reality, but I'm very practical with my executions, um, and I try to act sensibly when I can. Excellent. It, it's. I may have made me. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Whoops, we're, all, we're all guilty of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Like yeah. every time, slowly. Yeah. yeah, who are we kidding? Um, cool. All right, so Rainy. Yeah, I did not make myself. Um, my character is outgoing and involved. She will jump into your conversation, ask you all about it, join your plans, go do the thing. All right. Cool. And Jade, you got a second one yet? Or are you still thinking? I do. It's driven. Driven. Okay, cool. It's, nice. I think that, uh, I'm curious. I'm and driven. Yeah. Scary, but I definitely have an, an, an end for my memes. Excellent. I love it. Okay. So next we've got what do you like or dislike? Describe your favorite things. Foods, drinks, books, music, places, etc. Next, describe the things you dislike. Food, drinks, books, music, places. <laughs> kinds of events they throw in, etc. So, Alex. Likes and dislikes. Oh, man. Uh, I'm going to I'm have to take a... Can I hold my turn on this one? <laughs> sure, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Might need a little bit of time to think about this one. Okay, cool. Uh, so Jade likes and dislikes. Okay. Um, 
So as for likes, uh, water, obviously, is really just the most fabulous and perfect thing that there ever was. Um, I really love antiquities, uh, particularly architecture. Um, I love, I don't know, the, the age of things that have been made, the fact that they've lasted, especially since they last an awful lot longer than most of you do. Um, I also really like dreams. I'm really fascinated by the concept of creating something that you can't see or touch because that's so much of my life and it, I don't know, I don't have that, that part that you guys do. Um, as for dislikes, um, you know, I don't think, I don't think that I like, I'm gonna have to say salty foods. That just doesn't call to me. It seems strange. Why would you do that to your food? I don't know what that is. Um, leave it in the water it belongs. Don't put it on your food. Um, <laughs> also, I'm gonna say I have a really big problem with people who have um, like, like unkempt clothing. Like why would you choose to look like that? You can look like anything. Why that? Why here, you here. <laughs> so you don't really understand basic economics. No. I mean, this is all a product of your own imagination and creation. Why would you choose to be poor? That seems silly. That's right. Stop being poor. Just, just stop it. Just, <laughs> just stop. imagine yourself less poor. I see a future for you as a motivational speaker. <laughs> Or an Instagram influencer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I feel like the fairies were kind of the original Instagram influencers. Definitely. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Kenny, likes and dislikes. Um, <clears throat> I have, I have so far written down, I have one like and, and two dislikes. Uh, the thing that I like is a good work ethic. Uh, someone who's going to get off, get off their buns put on some boots and go do the, do the damn thing. Um, the things that I dislike is flying. I don't like flying. And I don't like uh, fast change. Like, I think change is necessary. We all like change. We all like the future, but we just need to take our time a little, <laughs> you know? <laughs> all right. So you don't like newfangled inventions. I, I understand their place. <laughs> I just think maybe we need to work up to him a little. <laughs> Considering that we have two gadget-oriented characters, I'm, I'm looking forward to a lot of, uh, you know, sort of snarking back and forth. <laughs> totally. All right, cool. So then we've got Santiago, likes and dislikes. I like quiet, peaceful places, such as bookstores, churches, quiet cafes, and tea shops. Uh, I like well-made things, especially if they're mechanical, uh, like watches, clocks, cars, trains, uh, other gadgets and similar, any newfangled devices that are not uh, gimmicky, but well-made and well that function flawlessly. Um, I love those, and I love trying to make them and so on. Um, I dislike liars. I really dislike bullies. Um, I extremely dislike being personally dirty. And um, to that end, I dislike being in dirty, disorganized, uh, or unkempt surroundings. Things should be ship shape. You should know where every spanner and driver is at all times. Um, it's either in your hand or where it goes. <laughs> like, why would it be elsewhere? Um, and uh, that's about all I got. All right, and Rainy. Um, so I like anything new. Doesn't have to be good or cool. Like new food, sweet. It's my new favorite thing. New creature, awesome. New favorite animal. Of uh, anything new, I'm like on it. I don't like being left out of things. I don't like secrets. I don't like people being excluded. Especially me, though. I want to be in, able to do all the stuff. Yeah, I've definitely got a friend with that personality, so <laughs> I know exactly where you're coming from. 
All right. Uh, so, come back around to Alex. I knew this would happen. <laughs> spotlight. The spotlight is on you now. Oh, God. All right. Well, I, I did come up with some stuff here. So, um, things that I like. Uh, I like learning about new people. I like listening to their stories. I like hearing about them. I like uh, kind of absorbing that. And I actually prefer it to speaking. I prefer just kind of like to, to do that. And I kind of, as a backstory thing, trace that back to his childhood. I made him an only child who grew up around a lot of adults. And he was kind of that, that, like, you know, not a piece of furniture, but he was kind of there in the background, always just listening and always kind of absorbing. And that kind of is translated to his adulthood, uh, which I've also, let's see, I, it kind of ties into what he dislikes, which is chaos, uh, particularly chaos of purpose or thought, but also in the case of things like chaotic crowds or anything where there's a lot of conflicting emotions or ideas and the reason for that, I think I'm kind of getting this idea or this feeling that he's a bit uh, of a kind of, not necessarily an empath, but kind of has that potential where he kind of uh, absorbs what's around him. So like if, if there's certain, uh, uh, you know, attitudes or thoughts or feelings or whatever, he kind of takes it on himself. And that maybe has something to do with what led to his current state as well. Something that he just doesn't really know about himself, but it's just kind of always been there. Nice. <laughs> I like that the uh, the prompt is like, "What's your favorite food or book?" And everyone's like, "Well, you see, really, my character is uh, you know most afraid of loneliness." You know, <laughs> like <laughs> that's I, I good did, though. I, d I did have another like. Uh huh. Um, since I had two dislikes, I figured I'd make two likes. Sure. Uh, and the second one is experiencing the finer things. Mm-hmm. Um, so as far as like favorite food or anything, he, he may not know, but if you give him a piece of fancy cheese, he'll definitely pretend to like it, you know? I'm foreseeing many, uh, many a scene in the dining car on this train. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Based on everybody, uh, you know, talking about food and, and good, good food and good wine. All right. Um, so now we're coming up towards the end here. Um, so... Now we're getting into the deep stuff. What really matters to you? Uh, now these are kind of little one word uh, answers. It's a, kind of a three part, a three part question, which is what principle do you value most in life? What is your most treasured possession? And what do you value most in the world? So the principle is like just kind of a pithy one or two word thing. I value honesty, I value a good time, I value fame, I value vengeance, right? And I feel like, again, I feel like we've maybe touched on this already to some extent. Um, and then of course, treasured possession, also very straightforward, could be anything. Trinket, a pet, a tool, a book, photograph, whatever. And then who do you value most in the world would be a person. Sister, brother, parent, lover, friend, teacher, public figure, yourself, no one. So, Alex, can I throw it to you? Sure. Uh, okay, so first up, what do you value, what, so what he values the most? What his, what his most? Yeah, like what's your one word, like your, your core value above all else? Okay, so I mean, I'm not sure if this is really, uh, it's kind of, a, I guess, somewhat an informal word, or it's, I'm not sure exactly if it's exactly right, but uh, the word copacetic comes to mind, mm -hmm. uh, which he just values when things are in harmony. I guess if that's the right, if I'm thinking about the right uh, definition of that, when things are harmonious, when things are, whether it's in an interpersonal conversation, one on one, there's that certain feeling, or whether it's a meal or whether it's a routine, you know, he just likes things to be just so, um, but in a kind of, um, you know, not a, a forced manner, but it just kind of turns out that way. When things turn out that way, he's, he, that's his happy place. Being Austrian, could we say that he values Gebündlichkeit? <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> sure. I, I, that's, uh, that sounds familiar from, from old German class, but... Um, 
Yeah, it's it's a German language word used to convey the idea of a state or feeling of warmth, friendliness, and good cheer. Other qualities encompassed by the term include coziness, peace of mind, and a sense of belonging and well-being springing from social acceptance. Perfect. Okay, yeah. <laughs> That, that is it then. I'll put it in the chat. So you Thanks. Yeah. Good. That, that's with a G, right? <laughs> G A. <laughs> uh, okay. As far as the rest of it, so so. Um, okay. Right. Yes. Uh, like so, what is a treasured possession, and then who do you value most in the world? Okay. So, treasured possession. I'm going to go with a pocket watch. It's it's a something that was given to him by his father, and it's always worked. And it's something that he uses as kind of a little bit of a um, you know something to remind him of of you know things kind of being in, in you know in correct order or or just operating correctly. And it's something that got him through a lot of the weird times that he went through. Just kind of this. Uh, it's a little bit of a Pulp Fiction-y kind of thing. I was just going to say, it's like, you sure it wasn't given to him by his father's friend? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I held this uncomfortable hunk of metal. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now, uh, this being the world of Castle Falkenstein, it could be a dwarven pocket, wa- pocket watch, if you're okay. so inclined. Yeah, I am. That, is, that sounds, uh, sounds pretty cool. All right. Va- uh, so tr- and as far as the value person, I'm going to have to think on that. I'm not quite sure. Sure. That. Natch. All right, uh, Jade. How about you? Principle you value most, most treasured possession, and who do you value most? Mm. So I think uh, the principle that matters most to me is discovery. I can't imagine or create things, uh, but gosh darn it, I'm going to learn about them. Definitely, uh, yeah. All of them. Um, as far as my most valuable possession, it is my collection of journals and field notebooks uh, that I've amassed over the centuries, cataloging people's dreams. Uh, All of the friends, lovers, acquaintances I've interviewed over the years of um, the dreams that they've had. I've spent countless hours organizing, cataloging, and just trying to picture all of these strange and fantastical images they report having in their very own heads. Cool. And then is there a person you value the most? You know, it's kind of a person's. Um, I I feel really strongly that the Atlantean people were the ones who really brought me into my corporeal form and inspired me to, I don't know, participate in in this side of the veil. And I really can't know them, that they're already gone. That was a really big disappointment to me. But there's something that really just drives me to try and get a little bit closer to them since they were my first sort of touchstone with uh, the human world. Yeah, I imagine fairies experience time slightly differently. So it's probably like how we've all been experiencing this year where it's like, really, is it it still March or is it August or is it December already? I I can't remember. Yeah, well too, like learning that the concept of March of that was, uh, I still don't quite get that one. (laughs) <laughs> right. You have to be reminded. <laughs> okay. And Kenny. God, I just had like the biggest wash of deja vu I've ever had in my life. <laughs> nice. You were meant was, to be here. I know. As I was like <laughs> typing out my most valued possession statement. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. That's right. Um, okay. So most valued principle for me uh, would be freedom something that I would gladly give my life for to ensure that uh, me or anybody else for that matter had the freedom that, um, you know, they were, they were born into. I think everybody was born into freedom. Um, Whether they have it or not, that's a, that's a problem for, for, you know, me to solve or somebody. You Americans and your ideas. That's right. I'm here to liberate everybody. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Everyone shake it world. up that's right shake it up um my most valued possession is a deck of cards that my father had on him when he died um i don't know what my father died of uh but when he died he had this 
the deck of American playing cards on him, and I took that. It doesn't uh, it doesn't have a bullet hole through it, does it? I don't think so. Not yet. <laughs> not th- it's not that dramatic. <laughs> it's not that dramatic. Yeah, I'm a pretty I'm a simple man. <laughs> our our cards don't got bullet holes in them, and <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't come from royalty. I grew up on the train tracks. <laughs> I ain't no McGillicuddy. <laughs> That's right. Uh, and the, as far as my most, uh, the third question was the most valued person in the world. Yeah. Who do you value the most? Okay, man. That's a good question. I probably would say uh, my mom. I think my mom might still be alive, though. She's probably old as hell. Ooh, you could like have letters home as part of your journal. Love that. Dear yeah, ma. I'd- yeah, I definitely keep up with Ma, and I make sure that she knows about all the stuff that I'm trying here in the in the old world, and uh, I let her know all about the fancy cheeses and wines, and I'm sending her back, you know, money and gifts. And well, she doesn't need any money. I I set her up before I left. Um, but yeah, I definitely I keep up with Mom for sure. Excellent. Get choked up thinking about it. Oh my goodness. All right, Santiago. He's also what? quite fond of apple pie. Ooh, with a big old <laughs> slice of American cheese on it, buddy. Nice, nice. That's awesome. That's right. You know. It. So it's interesting that uh, you said uh, uh, freedom, and um, more importantly, uh, the belief that there is uh, an inherent freedom to everything that breathes because this is also liberty is what I used to describe Iskander's um, highest ideal that every living creature is imbued with its creator to live its life and anything that tries to get in the way of that is just inherently wrong it's like that's right. A representation of, you know, the worm or the evil or whatever, and that liberty and freedom are the um, virtues that are, you know, aligned with um, the white and the light and so on and so forth and the good. Um, because he was raised by the person he values most, his surrogate father and mentor, the Imam Muhammad al Farouk, who by night was secretly a rebellious uh, inventor and tinkerer with these, um, you know, uh, heretical, you know, practices and, and arts and all this like uh, science and stuff like that, because he comes from a long line from back in the day of the people who invented algebra and named all the stars and all that sort of thing and you know, invented cosmology and, and all that sort of stuff before um, that was all, you know, um, damned by the church. So by day, he's this imam and by night, he's this inventor. And so that's where he got his uh, learned about this principle that you should question everything um and that you should never stand in the way of uh liberty or anything like that or anyone's personal liberty and so forth and to that note his most treasured possession is his toolkit because with that he can if he tries hard enough he can make anything and fix anything maybe even death damn all right and rainy all right. Um, my my highest principle is ingenuity. I value people who can be creative and solve things, and that's what I want to be. Um, the person I value most is my mother because she inspired me to look into this magic and how we can work with it as part of our thing. And so my possession that I carry with me is her journals from her adventuring days, which is really just this collection of tales. So I love reading through it about like Pecos Bill and some blue ox that did a thing and all this stuff. I just, I'm into it. (laughs) Pecos Bill. All right, cool. Uh, Excellent. So, uh, let's see, did we have, Jade, did you say you, uh, you were still thinking about your favorite person, right? Um, well, I sort of went with the Atlanteans. Oh, the Atlanteans, that's right. Who, yeah, it's kind who of my, was... touch, my touchstone community. That's right. Who was thinking about their favorite person? I mean, Alex. Alex, Alex, yeah. Alex okay. 
Uh, Go. All right. Well, uh, in total uh, discord with all everything I've said before about his enjoyment of listening to people and and you know being enthralled by people, his favorite person isn't a person at all. Mm -hmm. It's uh, his black cat, Katsibu. Nice. Uh, it's a uh, yeah. He just uh, his, his a cat that he kind of like a stray cat that came to him during his tenure as a diplomat um, and kind of gave him a lot of joy and. Uh, He's like a super tame cat for some reason. Like he's just kind of follows him around everywhere, even on two trains. So I'm imagining <laughs> uh, he's, he'll show up a little bit. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. It's a strict no pets policy. <laughs> You're going to have to leave the cat, cat behind. on a train when David is running a game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true, actually. Alex doesn't know about Blackjack. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> do it, Alex. It's a mistake. <laughs> oh, no. Too soon. Too soon. <laughs> too soon. <laughs> Look, I didn't write that part, okay? <laughs> all right, so uh, cool, excellent. No, by all means, bring your cat on the train. Uh, so moving along. Yeah, no. <laughs> all right, so then we've got, you stand with me or? So who or what is your nemesis? Uh, now I'd say this would be optional. You know, if you feel like your character needs a nemesis, by all means, give them an, a nemesis, an anemone. But uh, yeah, you don't need one per se, but it says a nemesis is a very Victorian idea, a person or organization that opposes you and that you have either set yourself to destroy or that has set itself to destroy you. All great Victorian characters have a nemesis. Holmes had his Moriarty, Rassendil his von Hensau, that's prisoner of Zenda. Uh, Captain Nemo had the whole world what's yours and then likewise what are your alliances alliances are friends that you are sworn to help organizations or causes you support groups like regiments or professional societies you belong to what are yours so i know it's a lot to think about but uh alex i'm going to throw you onto the fire yet again if, if, <laughs> oh, if, if alex wants to order last so to speak i can jump in <laughs> oh please yeah i'm playing okay. here all right, I will. I will switch you guys. <laughs> um, Go for it. Yeah, I actually, I, I, I totally found a picture of my nemesis, and I just posted him in the chat. Um, can kind of get a taste of what I'm going for here. I don't know. Oh, shit. A whole lot about him. Um, but yeah, this dude is 100% my nemesis. Kind of skinny, uh, some kind of European uh, aristocrat. Uh, maybe belonging to some kind of organization that is opposed to the Masonic Society. Uh, very small circular glasses with like the, you know, they're always blinding white, like an anime character. Um, and he's got uh, this Doberman uh, dog with him, point, you know, uh, pointed ears and all. Uh, it kind of has the same beady glare. Uh, I like that they're wearing matching medals too. I do too. I do too. Yeah, that's the, these guys are 100% my nemesis. Um, I don't know their names. Um, I would. Uh, I'm gonna guess. I don't really want to make him French um, or German. I think that's a cop out. But I uh, perhaps like. Um, I don't know. What do you th What do you think, David? When When you see this figure? He's British. Is he British? Yeah, it could be British. Uh, actually, the Brits are. So there's two sort of baddies in the old world and one is the um the prussians under bismarck and then the other one are the british because the british are uh ruled by what are called the steam lords which are the you know the sort of shadowy aristocracy uh running things you totally. know yeah power That's behind the throne kind of thing this dude 100 percent is one of those guys yeah steam lord of britain yeah steam lord of britain <laughs> so he would be sir something Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Well, he's he's Britain. I I, I kind of want him. Uh, this uh, will lean into your other interests or our other interests, David. Is I want him to have some kind of like Arthurian name, perhaps. Oh, okay. Sure. Um. Yeah. I mean, Mordred would be the obvious one, but um. Any like low key villains? <laughs> low key villains. <laughs> um. <sighs> keep it on the down low. Yeah. Well. The, the other thing is that it could be an, an ironic name where it's like the name of a, of a hero, like, you know, 
Percival. Percival was actually a popular name in the 19th century. You know, per so per Percival is my favorite of the. I think you know this. Per yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, I definitely want to call him Percival. Yeah. All right. Yeah. This dude sounds like a pompous. <laughs> I don't like him. <laughs> I already don't like him. <laughs> oh, I hate him so much. Yeah, I just made him up, and I don't like him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, man. And then my yeah. friends are obviously the Freemasons. Yeah, yeah, that's your organization. Um, yeah. Although, I, I don't know, I feel like I might have another, I, pr I probably have uh, an individual friend, so to speak, who's, who's probably not associated with the Masons. Mm. I just kind of like him because he's... Um, I keep saying he. I, I kind of I kind of imagine him as like a like a Leonardo da Vinci kind of character, hmm. uh, like an hmm. artist or somebody who's an inventor or something like that. Hmm. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. I, I think we we have tinkerers in the group, so I don't want to be like I'm going to go see my tinker friend, not you guys. <laughs> well, actually, speaking of creating uh, connections for the characters, it could be the dwarf Ryan Rhyme Engine Master who is the guy who invented calculation engines, who would then be a professor or mentor for Rainey's character. Ah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. So, you know. Maybe that's how we met. Yeah, yeah we, and we yeah. ran into each other that way. Exactly. He's going to be on the train anyway, so. Oh, uh, sick. Yeah. Cool. He's he's in the rule book, right? I can learn how to spell his name there. Yeah, it's rhyme, like the, like the rhyme. Oh, okay. Because uh, basically dwarves, like I said, there's no female dwarves, so they always marry these elf uh, maidens. Uh, so the elf, the elf maidens are always the mothers, and so the convention is that the mother gets to name the child, so they, if they have a dwarf baby, they always give it this very lyrical name. So you get these, like, grumpy, you know, crotchety dwarves with, like, named, you know, Tulip or whatever, so. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Cool. Uh, Jay, do you want to take a crack at it? Um, I don't know about a nemesis. Um, I think that uh, partially due to my curiosity, I'm I'm probably pretty open-minded and uh, accepting of most most people. I think that I'm uh, maybe pesky to some, but I'd like to think that I I don't know manage to ingratiate myself um, because that's the the best way I'm going to get access to pretty much anything that I want. Um, if you want to go really big, uh, the, you know, the leader of the unseelie court is known simply as the adversary. Mm. And he's a very kind of like Fantasia yeah, night, like night on bald mountain kind of thing. Yeah. 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 Very scary. I mean, actually, that's a great point because truly, um, uh, as imperfect as they are, I really love humans. They're so fascinating. And the fact that they can create is... It's really beautiful and the fact that his like sole purpose in life is to destroy them really it seems incomprehensible i can't imagine living in a world where nothing new is ever imagined all right and uh how about alliances well uh, as I mentioned, I'm quite charming and really uh, quite keen on getting what I want, especially information about these mysterious people below the waves. Uh, so I imagine I have some really solid connections with some of the uh, continent's finest architects, um, historians, uh, poets, um, anyone who can kind of give me that little clue into, I don't know, that like sort of lost world as well as that like whole realm of dreams. So I'm, I'm probably really uh, tightly knit into like kind of the academic circle for those reasons. Okay, cool. So yeah, you've got some, some allies amongst the Europe's universities, basically. Mm -hmm. All right. And Alex, how are you feeling? Can you elucidate on your nemeses and alliances? Sure. Uh, okay, so my nemesis, nemesis, I've uh, landed on a, another diplomat, uh, someone in right of my age, same age bracket, actually probably from either the same town or nearby, who's kind of been this childhood rival growing up, uh, and 
through some uh, string pulling or just general, uh, you know, shenanigans, he was placed in a much better position for his internship than I was. And as such, uh, he's advanced much further in his career where I pretty much stalled and have kind of, you know, so it's kind of like he's sort of this, uh, you know, uh, image of what could have happened with my character or where I could have gone, at least as far as being in this sort of ambassador station type of thing. And uh, he lets me know it. So it's not like he's a very, you know, he's not out to kill me or anything, you know, crazy like that, but it's, he's just kind of this, uh, a-hole who's just always rubbing it in and it's been something ongoing ever since you know my so ever since I was a kid so um, and maybe like you know the fact that he got this position was based on some kind of family tie or some other nepotism or something that went on that was kind of specifically done to sort of throw a roadblock in front of my character um, however uh, that ties into my ally and I believe that my ally would be although I'm leaving it open-ended um, would be someone from the Sealy court, someone who either I was, you know, um, served under or, or interacted with that this sort of, you know, it, it was meant to be this negative thing that was going to obviously would cause me a lot of trouble because just my personality and, and having to interact in that environment was just very much, very difficult, but radar in that realm. And whether they're whether I know about it or whether it's some kind of hidden influence or help that's being kind of sent my way, uh, I'll maybe leave that in your hands, but maybe that'll end up being a net positive for my character going forward. Oh, I've got ideas. Okay. <laughs> cool. All right. So then Santiago, how about you? Uh, I would say uh, for Nemesis would be the force that wiped out his village, who clearly had a leader. Um, Iskander Saim only briefly and in silhouette as well, but it was clear from that brief glimpse that this individual had uh, one arm longer than the other, and um, he either had wildly disarrayed hair or a headdress that made it look like that. Um, for alliances, I want to say there's this underground network of electromechanical engineers and scholars um, that correspond amongst each other when they're studying in, in secret and pursuing uh, electromechanical uh, engineering uh, because they live somewhere where they can't do so openly. So they try to learn amongst themselves. Excellent. Yeah, I'll have to look. There is a uh, Ottoman Empire supplement that came out for GURPS Castle Falkenstein, of all things, uh, which I'm not very familiar with. So I'll have to do some do some reading in there and see what what the political and uh, cultural scene is looking like. But yeah, that's good. All right, and Rainy. So I assume that my ally is probably the same as <laughs> uh, Kenny's character in that we both know Rhyme the Dwarf. Yeah. Pretty cool. So I'll go with that. And then I have to imagine there's some sort of group or institution that's anti this new technology. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> so, I mean, there's probably some built-in, like, nemesis sort of action there, but I don't know specifically what i would call them or if it's an individual who's been bugging me or anything like that mm. i mean it could be a, a number of things i mean obviously the prussians are desperate to get their hands on this technology because it's you know has obvious uh, military applications uh so it could just be you know prussia <laughs> is your nemesis you know like you're you're constantly having to deal with like prussian agents trying to steal your notebooks and stuff you know um, Maybe there's like one like Prussian agent in particular that I had to chase off one time when like she snuck into like Rhyme's office or something. Right. And like every once in a while I run into her and we have we have it out. Right. Yeah, I like it. Who knows where that's going? All right. So excellent. 
Uh, then we've got Ah Love. Describe your romantic life. High romance is a big part of Victorian life. What with secret assignations, doomed love affairs, feuding families, and various affairs of the heart. Describe your situation. Are you involved? And with whom? Is your love requited or not? Are there obstacles between you? Kenny, what do you think? Bro, how are you going to drop that on me? <laughs> oh, you're muted. Otherwise. Oh, yeah. You, you volunteered to take the first spot. Uh, you're right. Okay. Uh, my, phew, man, I can't imagine this dude's love life. Uh, <laughs> He's probably, um, I would say I'd probably fall in, what well, let me see here in my love life. Let me, hold on, I'm creating a character sheet as we go. Um, my love life is probably, uh, I wouldn't say fast and loose, uh, but I would probably say like he falls in love with, he falls in love easily. Um, he's probably gone his whole life, um, you know, visiting like brothel to brothel, probably, um, and especially in America. And then like out here, he's like, well, might as well find me a pretty young thing to settle down with and, uh, you know, see if we can go from there. So I bet he, I bet there's no one in particular right now that he's, uh, he's like head over heels with, though maybe somebody on the train, he's, he's probably like, you know, well, where are you going a little miss and <laughs> if she's heading to paris that that might be uh that might be a thing okay noted yeah all right how about jade do you have does uh does the nixie well yeah they're, they're lake ladies so of course they have a love life jesus how's how, how's your love life <laughs> well as a nixie uh as i pointed out we're we're far less silly than uh the others of our kind. And so I suppose you could describe my love life as title, uh, usually very intense, very brief, um, and numerous, of course. But uh, I just can't quite let go of that, um, I don't know, that knowing, that understanding that, you know, mortality is such a, you know, blink in the grand scheme of things. And it just really seems unwise i suppose to get too invested in any uh any individual i'm much more about um ideas concepts i think that i'm certainly drawn to uh creators and thinkers but it's really their ideas that i'm into they themselves i get kind of uh bored with i'm sure after a week or two so you tend to have more like intellectual love affairs would you say probably yeah i certainly think that i would just you know be utterly captivated uh by one individual at a time kind of just sap them dry practically of their um i don't know their their ideas their 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 dreams their um inspirations for the moment uh and then i'm done because i mean that's all they had for now All right, makes sense. All right, Alex. Okay. Um, so actually, after after the last section, I wrote down a few other things here, which I don't know about about my character, which may come later. But if not, I just kind of wanted to present them. Kind of ties into the ally thing a little bit, and then I'll go into that. And then I also wrote down some stuff for the uh, sure romances. Uh, so. Yeah, I keep saying like this. This experience with the Sealy Court was very, um, you know, it changed a lot of things. It was very—I don't want to say it was unpleasant, but it was very kind of dropped the floor out from under uh, my character. But that's not to say that you know it was a negative experience or there were any negative feelings on the part of the Sealies for that. I, I kind of think it's just a matter of like I look at my character as a very mild version of Renfield a little bit like his just being around <laughs> dracula kind of caused that or if wow. you guys have ever watched uh, in the mouth of madness uh sutter kane's agent <laughs> who's like shows right. up, you right. know how he's just been like exposed to this kind of energy so it's almost like a uh you know a radioactivity or something that's kind of affected him 
in a way, even though there was no maybe ill intent on the part of, you know, who he was with. It's just, you know, that's just kind of how, how he came up the other end. And so this kind of ties in a little bit to his romance, which I'm also going to drop some more movie references. Uh, so I, I believe he had two big romances in his life. One of them was uh, when he was a younger, you know, teenager, maybe, maybe perhaps in his early 20s, but, but younger was the kind of his, the hometown girl. It was his, you know, someone he knew growing up, someone who he went to school with or, or just knew the family of and, and everything made sense about that relationship, but it was very proper, it was very structured. Everything about it just made total sense. Uh, so that's one great love that, that ended up not going anywhere, but it's kind of just hanging over him a little bit. And the other one was a Seeley who he met later on. And the, the, my, the sort of comparison I'm doing is Big Top Pee Wee if you ever see that with this wow deep cut <laughs> with with uh, the circus performer and then his i don't know if anyone else has seen that movie but that's kind of the the idea where he has like these two things kind of pulling him in two directions and they also represent two different parts kind of of his personality and um you know so it's kind of actually order and chaos in a way and it's you know one of them's very makes a lot of sense and the other one's very unpredictable doesn't make sense but they're both kind of part of who he is so anyway that's what i got uh, I, i'm sensing a theme of internal contradiction yes yeah a lot of that going on good sure excellent all right so that takes us to santiago right the scander is wholly inexperienced with the fairer sex um, and as a result, he's very curious about them and how they make him feel. So he approaches this uh, as another puzzle to be solved. The, something with the inner machinations of all of this can, can be worked out, can be puzzled out if he can just find the right uh, equation. Uh, outwardly, he defaults to... Um, a strict sense of protocol and proprietary uh, propriety when dealing uh, with women because he doesn't know all the variables and he doesn't know all of the uh, answers yet, but he thinks he can figure it out. The poor fool. And he just knows that he's put a foot wrong with one uh, young lady once and they all around the world seemed to know about it simultaneously and disapprove. So to avoid that, he just defaults to protocol and respect. All right. An interesting journey ahead, I'm sure. Uh, okay. So Rainy, how about you? Um, so I would say like, I'm very interested in tales of romance. But I've been in school and studying and working with this magic tech and everything. So it's not something I've done, but it's like, it's a very romantic thought. Um, and I think that's about as far as she's gone with it. She probably has a couple of bodice rippers in her bag. Yeah, right. <laughs> very interesting. All right. So, so everyone's poised on the edge of love rather than deep into it. I did want to. Uh, I did want to kind of, uh, uh, I guess, re uh, restate because I, I I I got better with words. It doesn't seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted I got, to do the thing where well, I, I do yeah, the thing. Yeah, I wanted to do the thing. I'm I'm good with words. He he wears he wears his heart on his sleeve. That's kind of what I was going for. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's looking for that little miss to settle down with and share the rest of his days. But usually. That kind of falls into he, he falls into trouble that way uh, and and sometimes loses a bit too much money trying to make like, sense yeah, yeah trying to like impress this little lady yep yeah. yep yeah. all right okay so we are very nearly at the mechanical portion of the character creation process we just have one last thing and it kind of go, goes back a little bit to something kenny mentioned right at the top which is what are your personal goals? What are your goals in life? Uh, they say describe one social goal, one professional goal, and one romantic goal. All right. You said you said one personal. Uh, could you could you repeat those? 
one social goal, one professional goal, and one romantic goal. I take it on first, huh? Go for it, <laughs> if you want. Kick it to somebody else. Uh, yeah, if somebody else has it, I'll order last. Anybody? Anybody got it yet? Yeah, I could do it. Go for it. All right, so social goals at this point, because she's kind of fresh, is like, I just want to meet new people and hear new things and do new things. Um, professionally, my goal is to, much like Rhyme did, like put something together that's really unique and new and does something. Um, and then romantically, I mean, you know, um, fueled by all my bodice rippers in my bag, I would say, like, I'm looking for that someone who would support my intellect while also thoughtfully tearing the buttons off my clothes. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thoughtfully tearing the buttons off. <laughs> it's very specific. <laughs> it is very specific. Yes. Okay, cool. All right. Kenny? Okay. You said you, you said you had a goal of telling somebody to go to hell. I don't know I'd, if that's a professional goal or not. Uh, it might be a professional goal at this point, uh, since I'm semi-retired, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a section of my character sheet, mottos, uh, and see you, I just threw see you in hell in there. Nice. Um, but yeah, social goal is definitely going to be like, to uh, climb the ladder, uh, w which he equates to basically just being like, I want to be somebody, you know, like I, I grew, I grew up from nothing and now I, I made my fortune and I'm, I'm here in the big city and I, I, I'm ready to be somebody. Um, <laughs> professional goal right now might be to uh, tell somebody, you know, go to hell. <laughs> Professional goal, actually, I would say he uh, he wants to kind of well. I don't know if it's if it's a goal or a like a standard of like choosing his own like I, like I want to pick my jobs. You know what I'm saying? Would you, would you think totally? That's a, would you think that's a goal? Uh, yeah, like kind of being a being a free agent kind of yeah, thing. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like self sustained. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Become a self sufficient free agent. Yeah. Um, like a free agent wizard. <laughs> free agent wizard. Hey, buddy. <laughs> it's a loose cannon. I'm into it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I may work on that. I'm sure by the time everybody else goes, I'll have something else to say. <laughs> sure. Um, and then romantic goal is, is just to find that, find that little miss who wants to, who's, who's not just after the, the gold in my pockets. I'm, like she's in it for the long haul, however however long it is. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, as, as a rich American, you know, it's uh, plenty of plenty of people be interested. I'm sure. All right, uh, Jay, do you want to take a crack at it? Sure. Um, can you just remind me again what is the the date? The year that our campaign is taking place. We're going to kick it off in 1871. Okay. How stringently are we adhering to, uh, say, for these historical figures in our timeline, uh, living their actual, say, birth and death dates in this timeline? Oh, I think there's there's Slightly some wiggle room. Oh, definitely, yeah. Well, I hear there is this young academic uh, writer and journalist. Um, I can't remember his first name. I think the last name is Wells. That really stuck with me. And I hear he has heard of this incredible machine with which you can perhaps go to different timelines. I would love to talk to him and see if it'd be possible to go back to before the ruin of Atlantis. So finding this young, uh, young student, this young academic is, is sort of my social goal. Excellent. Um, as for professional, um, really, I feel like there are so many um, 
obviously there are different Earths, right? There's more than one. This is only the fifth one we've discovered so far. Mm -hmm. uh, there have to be other Earths, other gates to those Earths where these human imaginings, right? These dreams are real. And I am devoted to finding at least one of those gates. All right. Any romantic goals? Oh, no. I mean, despite having all the time in the world, I really feel like I just don't have time for that. All righty. Now, uh, I'll also remind you in terms of time travel, uh, not only is H.G. Wells around, the time traveler is a real person. Mm. And see, I wasn't <laughs> sure yet because I think H.G. Wells is like technically right now like a toddler. <laughs> okay. I think he was yeah. born. Was it? I just looked it up. He was born in 1866. Oh, okay. So I wasn't sure if that his like fictional character, like how manifested they are. Well, if he ex if he exists in the future, he will exist now, right? Ah, That's true. Well. <laughs> but let me just uh, let me just share. There's there's a little section in the rule book that has uh, quick stats for different fictional and historical figures. I'm just going to share my screen here so uh, you can see. Right there. Well, in that case, I need to know that guy, but he has no first name. How am I supposed to find him? Exactly. We don't know who he is. Who is this um, guy? We don't right, know. So that, all right. So Mr. Wells is just the iceberg. This yes. Guy. Yes. Mm. <laughs> this bitch. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Excellent. And uh, Alex, what are your goals? Okay. Uh, social goal is to uh, put, so to speak, put the puzzle back together. So, mm. you know, the, I kind of have this, this idea that, you know, he was this full, you know, fully formed puzzle all put together, broke apart, and now he's kind of building it from the inside out. And maybe it's a different puzzle even, uh, but he wants to kind of put that back together. So that's kind of just his, I guess you would say, maybe more of a personal goal or social development or something like that. His um, professional goal is to surpass his rival. So that sort of adversary character who's rubs it in his face, how awesome he is all the time. My character would love to get, you know, one up on him and, and you know, kind of climb to a, you know, some sort of, uh, sit, put himself in some sort of situation that he feels like he's, uh, he's uh, surpassed him. Uh, romantic, I, I don't know if he has any romantic goals. Uh, I think that could happen, uh, and he's he's open to the idea, but uh, so his life is just kind of too weird right now, I think. He's just kind of all over the place, so uh, no, no particular goals in that way. All right. You're like um, the Michael Keaton, Bruce Wayne, and the 1989 Batman. Yeah. <laughs> My life is very complicated. All right, Santiago. Um, I'd like to, socially, I'd like to meet and collaborate with other electromechanical adepts and scholars, um, which kind of ties into my professional goal of completing my journeyman piece. I have this invention, this device that I'm yeah. working on, and I'd like to complete it to capstone my my journeyman status before i continue with my education and work on a masterpiece and so on um romantically he knows he knows and has uh, learned a little bit from talking to you know mentors and uh similar that he is prone to just falling head over heels in love with the first woman to give him any romantic attention so he's really on the lookout for that and wants to avoid that happening but he may not be able to. All right. Sounds like a challenge. <laughs> okay. okay. Now that has everybody gone? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Everyone is gone. Okay. I'm going to go again. <laughs> okay. What the hell? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Social goal is still the same. Yep. Professional goal is to start my own business mm. and pass it down to my son who does not yet exist. Correct. Um, and then romantic goal, or son or daughter, you know, offspring. 
Whatever. And then my goal is still to find that little miss, but I want to find I want somebody who's educated uh, so we can build something together. All right. Sounds good. Okay, so at long last, we are at the mechanical portion of character creation. This is super complicated, it's super crunchy. <laughs> My brain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all about optimization. It's all about, like, you know, getting the min max combos worked out perfectly. I'll take whatever penalties for being old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll be a septuagenarian barbarian. All right, um, so let me just throw a little image out onto the... Oh my god, it is a little image. That is tiny. Wow, that is unreadable. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, let's see. Let me see if I can make it a little a little more readable. Is that readable? I don't know. On the roll 20, I have put a concise skill list. It may or may not be readable. Um, so... These are your uh, qualitative abilities, right? These are, these are what you are good at and what you're poor at. Um, so what you need to do is from ye oldie list, you need to pick out some of these abilities that you're gonna jot down uh, as being things that you are great at, good at, and then poor at. So before you start picking willy-nilly, let me go back to the sort of sample occupations here, uh, of which I have been jotting down based on your uh, description. So all of you have sort of described your characters uh, as one of these sample occupations, which is very easy, very helpful, and very uh, very easy to uh, to access here. So uh, so. For example, Santiago, you have described your character as what sounds like an inventor. And so for you, you would want to prioritize education, tinkering, and perception. Now, Alex, as a diplomat, you would want to prioritize connections, education, and perception. Kenny, as a wizard, you need to take sorcery. That's not not even a choice. And courage and education are also recommended. And then uh, Jade, as a Nixie, um, obviously you're going to want uh, one or two fairy powers, right? You're going to want your uh, kindred powers, probably, and then either what is it, uh, glamour or etherealness. And then um, kind of depends on how you see your, your character. This, this is kind of the most open-ended one. You know, stealth might be one, or, um, you know, if you're uh, more of the kind of high-level uh, connections or comeliness might be more appropriate. And then Rainy with the Calculation Engineer, you're going to want Education, Perception, and Tinkering. Okay, so the way the mechanics work is that from this list, as you cast your eyes over this list and you've noted down your most important abilities, from this list you are going to pick one ability that you are great at. Uh, now, for source for wizards, sorcery cannot be that one ability because it is very very hard to master. It has to be in the next category, which is an ability you are good at. And so everyone can pick three or sorry four abilities that you are good at. And sorcerers have to make one of those choices. Sorcery. Okay. Where did and you then, say, uh, uh, sorry, where did you say that list was? Oh, it's on the roll 20. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, from that list, you're going to choose one ability that you are poor at. Oh. If the assumption you've got one great, four good, one poor, are the rest all just average then? They are automatically average, yeah. Okay. 
So if being a Nixie, I have other ones that are specified as being one or the other. Should I assume that those are part of my like great, good, poor, and then just everything else is average? Yeah, it's kind of like with wizards where it's like they have an automatic good sorcery. It's the same same deal. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, sorry, I was I was reading the list. So we pick, and, and the the three that we pick one for each, like great, good, and poor, right? Pick right. one one a piece. No, no, uh, one for great, one for poor, and then four goods. Oh, okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And if you have any questions about any of these particular, they do they do have little write ups in the book, so I can I can quote from the book if you need me to. So I know tinkering is one of mine, but what would be craftsmanship? All right. So craftsmanship is the skill of making beautiful and well-crafted objects, whether glass, wood, metal, cloth, or pottery. With this ability, you can fashion jewelry, clothing, fine carvings, and the like. Average craftsmanship allows you to make a paperweight for your mother. Great craftsmanship can be used to make saleable items like jewelry or clothes. Exceptional craftsmanship, well, you don't get access to that, so... Yes, there are levels above great that you can aspire to. There's exceptional and there's extraordinary. I think I think I have my uh, my abilities. Uh, would you like me to tell them to you? Please. And you can tell me if I'm if I'm off base or if if, uh, if these are weird. Mm-hmm. Uh, by great, I put courage because um, that was something I noted early earlier that like my I'm, I'm courageous. Uh, my goods are sorcery, education, marksmanship, and leadership. And then my poor is tinkering. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, great. Cool. How's everyone else doing? I think I've got mine. Go for it. I figure since I'm kind of newer at it, I actually put my great in education. And then for good, I did tinkering, perception, physique, and charisma. Mm-hmm. And then my poor stat is stealth because I am not subtle. <laughs> nice. All right. Yeah, education is the amount of formal education you have had. So uh, the higher your education, the more you know. The more you know. And in fact, it says a great education is equivalent to a university degree. So there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Of note, it says you can speak your native tongue, Latin, some ancient Greek, and at least three other languages. So something to think about. Uh, David, I'm thinking that I fought in a war. Mm Mm-hmm in probably the 1820s but you said we're in 1876 71 71 okay that's fine i i think i was born in 1800 oh wow so you're quite old yeah i'm like 71 i guess okay is that cool that's fine okay yeah. sick yeah i'm pretty old um is there a is there a war i know it said somewhere that like um to gain, to like, for the Californians to gain their empire, they had to like fight like the Mexican, their Mexican rulers. Uh, yeah, yeah. Is there a war that's uh, associated with that that I could have maybe been in? I don't mind adjusting my age at all. That's pretty fle- flexible. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'd I'd have to check the the source books to be sure, but I mean in. Historically, in our own history, the Texan revolutions in the uh, 1835 to 36, and then California, of course, uh, you know, is is uh, uh, taken away from Mexico in the you know Mexican American War, which is ten years later. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, like I'll have to check in the Castle Falkenstein, you know, timeline is. Like sure. how 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 that differs. I'm not sure how that differs, but it, it, it would it would probably be around that time, like 1830s to 1840s. You know, okay. if if that's the case, I may I may be like 61 then. Okay. Yeah. Sure. That makes and sense. And then yeah, I'll I'll put that down. 
It's like the uh, sorry. What what war were we just talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, it kind of depends. I mean, there's the Texas Revolution, and then ten years later, there's the Mexican American War. The, I think that's the one. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll put that down as a placeholder and I, put it as a placeholder. Yeah, and I'll I'll get to you about the specifics there. If I went to university in Bavaria, would it? Makes sense for me to speak German as one of my additional languages. Oh, definitely, yeah. All right. Could I take German, Californian English, and Dwarvish? <laughs> Californian English. <laughs> like, totally. Right. <laughs> I'm, I would imagine I'm fluent in that, but I have no <laughs> idea what it means. <laughs> oh, man. Well, for instance, how do you say mirror? Mirror. Mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Sanji makes fun of me so much for that. <laughs> but yeah, is it okay if I speak really the dwarven well, language well, sure. since my main professor is a dwarf? Yeah, I mean, I'm assuming okay. there is one. If not, then uh, I'll let you know. I'll okay. just double check on that. But yeah. <laughs> just making notes here. Okay. Anyone else want to share their abilities? Uh, I have some that I'm entertaining right now, so maybe we can mm -hmm. suss them out with your expertise because we have a rule book as well. <laughs> uh, what are you great at? I'm thinking inventor should be great at invention. Yeah. Um, so hopefully that checks out. Uh, what are you good at? Uh, tinkering. I will, wanted to put education, but I don't know if that's too high given that he's just going into university, but he also has a uh, more of a trade school type of education, given that he's working on a journeyman piece. So that might uh, check out that way. Uh, the other two were physique and athletics, because dude is just yoked out. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's a Turkish get ups with the kettlebells and all of that sort of thing. <laughs> Squat <and> thrusts. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> all of that. <laughs> Now, uh, just to just to differentiate with invention, invention is more about conceptualizing. So that's like you know that you're you're the person who's taking out patents and that kind of thing. You're not oh, necessarily building. Guy. Yeah, you're not necessarily building anything. So if you want to be more of a builder, you should put tinkering in in great. Okay, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'll definitely switch those around. Yeah. I have a question. Mm hmm. So for um, my kind, we automatically come with two skills that are core, which are fisticuffs and mm -hmm. nature, actually, mm -hmm. which is like the kindred power for mixed bees, which is interesting. That is interesting. Um, but since I'm a fairy, I was wondering, could I choose to add a third core skill, invention, and then maybe take an extra good skill or something like that uh yeah i think that's actually in the book uh that you can take an extra poor skill and and take a good skill so yeah no all right oh and and uh <clears throat> kenny i just wanted to mention really quick before i forget uh if you want to actually have your wealth as something you can access you should take x checker at uh at least good level x checker x checker yeah this is not just the actual amount of money you have on your person, but also your general economic status. Okay. So a, a good exchequer assumes you are considered to be well off, and a great exchequer means you are considered to be wealthy. I'll replace leadership with that then. Yeah, that makes sense. A strange word. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, E X C H E Q U E R. That's correct. There you go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It is one of those weird ones, like comptroller. Like, oh gosh! Oh, it's one of my <laughs> least favorite words. Cyril <laughs> <laughs> <Cereal> figus. Like, <laughs> All right, uh, so um, yeah. What is cool. yeah? I got a question. What's mesmerism? Like, and, and are any of these skills like? I mean, some of them seem kind of like. I don't want to say mid-maxing but like if i was like oh i'm really bad at being ethereal like is that kind of like cheating or like what's <laughs> well uh ethereal glamour and kindred powers are fairies only so sorry about okay. it no no that's fine uh i know you're trying to min-max so don't... no no i'm quite the opposite <laughs> I, probably, I swear 
Oh, yeah, right. Uh, um, um, so mesmerism is the ability to use the mental science of Dr. Anton Mesmer to hypnotize others to your will. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's fair game, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. Okay. I think I have my skill list almost done. I have uh, my great skill, perception. Then good, I have connections, education, fencing, and I'm still kind of one, like for my fourth good skill, I'm kind of going between charisma and social graces. I think I'm going to do social graces over charisma. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then poor skill be mesmerism, and that's based on just, uh, he's got like a, a um, he's just against the whole idea of using that kind of ability to force people to, you know, think a certain way. So it's more of like a moral mm. ob objection. So he's kind of just against it on principle. I would say that that might actually make you resistant to being mesmerized too. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, in that case, I'll do yeah social graces for the uh, fourth good skill. I think I'm ready. All right, cool. Uh, Jade, how are you looking? You know, I'm actually wondering. Can you give me kind of a breakdown of the differences between, say, charisma versus social graces versus connections? Absolutely. So let me get to charisma. Like ability and the ability to relate to others. Poor charisma means people feel uncomfortable around you and tend to avoid you. Average charisma assumes that you're like most people. A few close friends, a few enemies, most people are willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. Good charisma means you're a likable sort. Most everyone you meet will feel comfortable talking to you and enjoy your company in turn. Great charisma means you are one of the people who makes friends very easily. You are always the most popular person around with friends everywhere. Connections, the level of society you are likely to come in contact with and by influence whether you know a particular person, also whether you will be permitted to enter another societal level. Uh, so poor connections assume you're only the, uh, you know only the true demi monde, thieves, criminals, street trash. Average connections assume you socialize with the common man. Good connections assume you know people of better quality important local figures, minor officials, uh, socialites. Great Connections assumes you socialize with very lions of society. Mm. And then Social Graces, your ability to master the complex social rules and manners that make up everyday steam age life. Social Graces includes your ability to fit into social situations, to know what to do when confronted with an unfamiliar table setting or an equally unfamiliar social encounter. <laughs> oh shit, there are seven forks on this one. Oh, what's the seventh one for? Uh, social graces also include your ability to cut a dash on the ballroom floor and your knowledge of Burke's peerage and proper modes of address for all occasions. <laughs> social graces are a very important ability to have if you expect to do more with your life than muck about in the sordid gutters of some lower caste rookery somewhere. <laughs> Damn. Nice. Damn. All right. Well, in that case, um... For the next skis, I get uh, exceptional comeliness. Um, I automatically have great charisma, good perception, physique, stealth, and shapeshift. And then poor fisticuffs and raise nature, which is my kindred power, which is kind of sad that that one's poor. Yeah, but, well. Um, because, again, I'm going to go with... Uh, really hard the whole theories can't imagine anything i'm going to choose invention as a poor skill mm -hmm. imagine i'm not bad at tinkering because if it's already built i can mess with it but i can't create things on my own um and i'm going to go ahead and choose connections for my good skill to offset that okay sounds good yeah that makes sense do we get everybody I do my poor one. Oh, what's your poor yeah. one i also am poor at stealth Again, I just I can't. I I'm just not good at hiding or sneaking around. I'm kind of yeah, no, that makes sense. Big and all that. Maybe if I can try to impersonate a wall, it might work. <laughs> oh man, wool so and pinstripe wall. <laughs> <laughs> all right, excellent. So, with all that. That really just leaves you, now that you have a bundle full of notes and a Pinterest board and every other thing, uh, 
it's really just kind of up to you. I'll, I, I've created the Obsidian portal. I will send out that link to everyone once it uh, looks like something other than, de than the default. And you can go ahead and create your character uh, entry on the wiki there and, and get to town. I'm going to send out via email their examples of like how you kind of uh, pull everything together into a page long diary entry that is also your character sheet. Mm. And um, last but not least, my personal favorite of any character creations uh, session is the equipment. Uh, so <clears throat> I will also send these out in the email, so don't worry about jotting everything down, but just to give you an idea, for the wizard, possessions, revolver or sword cane, hooded cape, a thick locked book containing notes on certain spells and preparations, and a power focusing symbol of some type, ring, wand, staff, or other object. For the, who's next, who's next in reverse alphabetical order, uh, let's see here, do do do. What do we got next? Ah, for the inventor. Uh, possessions. Large satchel containing assorted tools and equipment. Shabby voluminous notebook containing detailed plans of your invention, which you're in the process of constructing. Partially filled out royal patent forms. For the diplomat, we have got a sword cane, a revolver, a dispatch case, ministerial portfolio and papers, and a diplomatic code book. And for the calculation engineer, uh, an automatic abacus, engine repair, repair tools, a copy of Dr. Babbage's Manual of Engine Mainten Maintenance, and a copy of Lady Ada's Theorems and Practices of Calculation. Also, several Jacquard program cards you have written, notes on the operation of calculation engines, some new designs to improve same, quotes from Loveless, Babbage, and Pascal. And... Uh, for the Nixie, I have no idea. <laughs> it's kind of up to you, I think. Uh, I'm just kind of looking at like the fairies that are in the core rulebook. Uh, pixies have <laughs> pixies have brief, revealing clothing of mist and flowers, or fine fairy chainmail, a slim hat pin sized sword of fairy gold, or an elfish bow made from a stock of thistle. Of course, it's all pixie scale, uh, pixie size. So, but you know, maybe something along those lines. You know. Mm -hmm. Something from like a Brian Frude, uh, you know, book from 1979, no doubt. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so let's see. Alex, did you come up with a name yet? I have. He's, uh, his name is Frederick Haas von Metternich. Nice. And I actually found a uh, Clemens von Metternich, who is an Austrian diplomat mm -hmm. uh, from... 1821 to 1848. I might have to do a little more reading to see uh, what his deal was, but that's kind of where I got the name, whether or not that's actually his, you know, parent or not. We'll, we'll... Yeah, it could be. Uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a major mover and shaker in European politics in the 19th century. So, um, yeah, if you were, like, related to him, that, that would be a whole other... <laughs> whole other uh, thing to feel like kind of uh, overwhelmed by like oh god I'm always in father's shadow <laughs> anyway all right so any other last last little tidbits uh, I did come up with a name oh yeah I don't Go know for if it. did everybody else everybody else did names right I think everyone else did yeah, yeah. okay great uh, my name is Grizzly Grant Morgan uh, oh, good. Yeah, Grant Morgan. I, I can see the buckskin now. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> uh, Grant Morgan is my birth name. Um, the The nickname Grizzly Grant it comes from uh, it's an old war story. Uh, I was out scouting out a company of Mexican military men uh, when a California grizzly appeared behind us. Uh, Grant fought off. Well, I fought off the bear. Uh, with only a knife, so as not to alert the company uh, with which we were scouting, uh, which allowed me and my troop to get the drop on the Mexicans and overtake them without without firing a shot. Nice. Probably the only uh, uh, exceptional moment of my life. 
Apart from being able to like weave magic and that kind of. Apart thing. from now being able to weave magic, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know that whole thing. That whole thing. <laughs> oh that oh this whole thing. <laughs> oh this whole thing. Oh this old tome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, very cool, everybody. Uh, excellent characters. Uh, they're going to fit in really well with the uh, the dramatic story I have planned. So I'm looking forward to it. And yeah, I'll be sending out email with details on writing the diary entry, invites to the Obsidian Portal. I've got a couple couple little questions to answer that I'll be sending out. So much to do, but we will uh, meet back uh, next Tuesday. Fantastic. Huzzah. Huzzah. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> it's good awesome. seeing everybody. I'm yeah, super, nice super pumped. Yeah. yeah this is awesome. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Looking forward to it. Yeah. It's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, boy. Here we go. All right. So, anyway. <laughs>